Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, I will call into open session this meeting of the Arlington Independent School District Board of Trustees for August the 1st, beginning at 7.20 p.m. I want to thank everybody for coming out this evening. Um, before we move into um, our next thing, just want to announce that um, I have a medical emergency in my mouth, so talking on this microphone is very painful to me, so at this time, I am going to turn over for presiding over the meeting to Dr. Ann Reich. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. She has no idea what she just did. <laughs> now, uh, with all seriousness, we will uh, conduct business as usual. As is uh, our normal custom, we will begin with the opening ceremony. Uh, please uh, join Mr. Chapa in uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, please be seated. And if you would now please silence all cell phones and any electronic devices uh, that you have to avoid disruptions to those around you. And if you'd also please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. All right, there, uh, this is a, a called uh, work session. Uh, the only item is a discussion item uh, on the agenda, the capital needs recommendations for a 2020 to 2025 uh, bond program. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, Dr. Reich. And so this evening, uh, we continue in this journey of uh, bringing our capital needs uh, recommendations to the board for processing and uh, deliberation and discussion. And so, as you know, and we, we start with a big thank you to our committee and our committee chairpersons uh, for their leadership uh, in this work. It's been a journey, uh, and so we're, we're getting towards that part of the journey where uh, we're, we're refining. And I just appreciate all the work that Cindy and Powell and uh, Kelly and your staff have done in, in preparation for this. So um, at this time, I'll ask Ms. Powell to lead us off in the discussion and, um, and review again our capital needs and our options. Ms. Powell. Good evening, uh, President Mays, <laughs> Dr. Rice, board members, Dr. Cavazos. Uh, good evening. Welcome back from summer break. Um, you will recall that on June 25th, uh, we met in a work session, and at that meeting, we presented to you uh, recommendations from the Capital Needs Steering Committee uh, for, uh, again, the capital needs to carry our district through the year 2025. Uh, we had a, a, a lengthy discussion that evening uh, around a number of things. We started with the review of the 2014 bond program. We looked at tax rates. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, the recommendations from the Steering Committee. Um, we also talked uh, very briefly about uh, the results from the first uh, bond awareness survey that was performed. And uh, then we looked at more detail, in more detail, at the uh, capital needs um, or cap, uh, the facilities master plan. We also talked about uh, other capital needs in the area of safety, security, and technology, fine arts, and transportation. Uh, the board asked a lot of questions that evening. We answered most of those questions. Uh, there were some uh, questions where we, we explained that we would need to bring back uh, some additional information to the committee or to the board. And so tonight uh, I'm going to give you just a, a real quick recap of the committee's recommendations. And uh, then as we go along, I, you will see that we've tried to blend in uh, some of the information that you all asked about at that meeting on June 25th. And then we'll open it back up uh, for uh, your discussion. We have with us this evening uh, George Williford uh, from Hilltop Securities. And he will speak uh, briefly about uh, 
the district's debt position. And then we also have Ray Turco with us this evening, and Ray performed uh, both the original surveys on uh, bond awareness and then the follow-up survey that we conducted after uh, the June 25th board meeting. So we have some results to share with you for that. Uh, we also have with us this evening David Sturtz again from Cooperative Strategies, and David has helped shepherd us uh, through the entire process, and we appreciate him being here to help us. And we have uh, Gary Hill and, and Jeannie DeKine from the co-chairs from the Capital Needs Steering Committee. So uh, I think uh, between all of us, uh, hopefully we can address your questions and have good conversation. So um, you'll recall that uh, the Steering Committee reported out that um, uh, with a vote of 100% support, uh, they were recommending a package of capital needs uh, to the board, and we presented those needs uh, on the 25th. They total up uh, 900 and almost $966 million. Uh, you see the breakdown here in four uh, major buckets, if you will. Uh, facilities being the largest piece at uh, $846 million, and then uh, safety, security, technology, transportation, and fine arts as well. If you look at the entire package of the, the 965.9 million, uh, this is how it breaks down. 45% uh, of those funds are uh, directed towards condition upgrades for current facilities. And then we have 33% uh, uh, of the dollars being spent uh, for new facilities. And then uh, the other bucket is comprised of the technology, safety, and security uh, bucket, along with transportation, uh, fine arts, and then also the um, FF&E that goes with uh, uh, many of our projects. There are a number of ways that we have sorted the data um, and presented it. Uh, if you look at it based on grade span, uh, this is what it looks like. The bulk of the dollars uh, are in the elementary area. Uh, we have in that category, uh, we are building three new elementary schools. Uh, we also are making uh, improvements at uh, most of our schools for uh, the implementation of full day pre-K uh, and uh, also new playgrounds. So uh, a lot of cost uh, directed specifically at uh, elementary. That's why that is the largest category. But you see um, how that breaks down amongst uh, the, the different grade spans. The other category, uh, we have a, there are a number of things in that category, including property acquisition, uh, furniture fixtures and equipment, and then again, uh, the safety, security, and technology uh, needs, and transportation and fine arts. Um, and then this is where we also carry um, our factor for um, program contingency and inflation and future design cost. We've seen this uh, a, a variation of this uh, particular slide uh, at our previous meeting. This is simply where we've taken uh, all of the all of the different projects that make up the 965 million dollars, and we present it here uh, rank order from largest to smallest. Uh, I pointed out in a message we shared with you yesterday that as we've continued to roll up some of the data and work on these presentations we found where our uh, last version that we shared with you, we had some specific costs that had rolled up into line items where we really didn't think they should be. And so we've reclassified them here. Uh, and so the numbers on this particular slide are a tick different than what you have uh, seen previously. All still the, the 965. The uh, condition needs uh, make up uh, the largest portion of the 965. Uh, here at 39%, uh, and uh, then you see that immediately behind that is uh, the investment to rebuild four schools, one junior high and three elementary schools, and you see how the rest of that falls out. In the area of new construction, again, uh, we are proposing to replace uh, four aging schools, Carter Junior High, and then three elementaries, Barry, Thornton, and Webb. Uh, we also have funds in the package uh, to um, make renovations and add an addition at Gunn Junior High to create the junior high level uh, fine arts dual language academy. There are also funds here 
uh, to extend that program, the Fine Arts Dual Language Academy, into the high school grade span uh, with an addition and renovations for one high school to be determined uh, for that program. Uh, and then also uh, we have included dollars to phase in the rebuild of our service center. Early on we had uh, contemplated uh, rebuilding all of it as part of this bond package uh, in an effort to contain the overall uh, cost of the program. Uh, we prioritized some things out and this was a particular project where we determined that we could phase that rebuild and so phase one would be uh, with this uh, proposed bond package and would involve replacing um, the transportation offices and security facilities adding uh, some uh, covered secured parking for our buses and also parking for uh, employees for the entire service center where we are woefully short of parking spaces. And then also right sizing Bailey Junior High with a building addition. We talked a lot uh, last time about uh, our East Arlington, the comprehensive plan to rebuild uh, some schools in East Arlington. Uh, that plan involves uh, closing actually Roark and Knox, both uh, very old schools with a lot of very significant uh, uh, facility needs, condition needs in them, and then rezoning those kids uh, to Thornton and to Barry and uh, some other neighborhood schools, and then rebuilding uh, Thornton and Barry, also then rebuilding Webb, which sits up on Cooper, as we know, just south of, of I-30, and then um, swapping land with the city so that we swap with them our Roark site for a city park that is adjacent to Knox Elementary. That then would allow us enough space at the Knox site to relocate Carter Junior High there and, and build a new Carter on that site. Um, Carter's existing site, as we all know, um, has some um, some challenges with Johnson Creek that, that clips a corner of the property and uh, has caused some problems with our athletic field and prevents us from even having a track around the football field. Uh, Carter as well is over 60 years old and has some very significant needs uh, and so the proposal would be to build um, a, a bigger Carter at the Knox site uh, with a football field and track and to turf that field so that uh, uh, the neighborhood uh, can use the field. You can see from this uh, image uh, the little blue dots across the map show um, our Carter students and where they reside. So the large circle on the far left uh, circles where Carter is located today. And you can see from this that the majority of Carter students actually live further east and so by relocating Carter to the Knox site, we would be placing the school uh, more in the center of where the Carter students reside. We've got several slides here regarding uh, some of the different things that you all asked about uh, in the last meeting. This particular slide is an aerial of the service center. And the question uh, was asked, well, what would be phased in and what uh, would uh, uh, be deferred to a future bond program? It's a little difficult to see, but uh, the boxes in red um, are spaces that uh, we would propose to rebuild. And uh, so on the far right, uh, you will see the long, narrow, uh, vertical-looking rectangle. Uh, that is where we would propose to construct additional covered parking for our buses. And then above that, uh, the next box up in red uh, would be where we would propose to uh, build a new office space for transportation and security. And then uh, behind that, uh, we would have parking in red, additional parking for transportation employees. And uh, then uh, you can see also beyond that, uh, even more parking. The areas in yellow would be phase two. Uh, the large space in, uh, outlined in yellow is uh, the rest of the service center, the maintenance and operations area, and our warehouse. And we would hold on those uh, to what would potentially be the next bond package, uh, presumably five or so years. 
Again, there are a number of different ways that, um, that we can roll all this data up. We have a, a, a mountain of uh, detailed um, uh, schedules showing uh, what we have identified as facility needs at every building in the district. And in this particular presentation, uh, we've rolled it all up by high school network and then by the major categories of condition needs that uh, we, we worked off of throughout the assessment. And so you can see we've done the shading here um, to show the column on the far right is the percent of each of the, uh, the dollars by network to the total. What you see here is that uh, the percentage is, the percentage of the total tracks very nicely with the age of the buildings, and the square feet in that network. So for example, Sam Houston uh, has uh, approximately 2.5 million square feet of building space throughout that entire network. It is our largest network. The average age of the buildings in that network is 40 years. Well, given the, very, the size of uh, that na network overall, the condition needs actually represent the largest portion of uh, the total identified needs. And you can see how that uh, progresses throughout all the, um, uh, the different networks. Um, there are a number of items captured in these dollars that on the previous slide that we looked at that, uh, I'm gonna go back a couple of slides, um, this slide that has uh, the breakdown of projects, uh, we pulled out some major things here. Some of these items, a lot of these items fall into condition needs. Anything other than new construction is captured under the condition header. And so um, when we slice data different ways, there may be some overlap as far as where these things show up on these particular presentations. There was a question last time about um, you know, what we used as uh, lifespans for equipment and different systems within our buildings as we did our assessments because I, I think the question was, is there any possibility that we are replacing items uh, too quickly? Uh, so what we've shown you here uh, are the lifespans, the life cycles uh, for a variety, all the, the different systems that we've assessed within our buildings. Uh, these are industry standard. And so as we went through and did our assessments and then as the architect firms we worked with came behind us and likewise um, uh, evaluated buildings, uh, it was all within this frame of uh, the, the life cycle of various pieces of equipment. Uh, we make repairs, we do routine maintenance, uh, we replace things uh, uh, in various bond programs. So it may be that we have a particular building maybe an older building, but we've replaced a number of the systems in them. So we are evaluating the capital needs of the building both from a very granular level based on the specific uh, piece of equipment and then uh, holistically for the building based on its overall age and condition. So this guided our work. Uh, this uh, representation simply again an, another way to show the uh, condition improvements and sorting it uh, very graphically, very visually uh, by these different broad buckets. So you can see that uh, the things that fall under site improvements including playgrounds, including um, um, the condition work for um, athletic fields, competition fields uh, falls here. Uh, interior renovations is everything from painting uh, to lighting to uh, flooring. Uh, HVAC is a standalone category, you see that there. Uh, and then the condition, uh, the renovations and additions for kitchens uh, fall out in a separate category. So full day pre-K, uh, there are dollars in the bond package to allow us to uh, support uh, full day pre-K. Uh, you know, with House Bill 3 that was passed by the legislature, uh, that, that bill has mandated that full day pre-K be implemented beginning with the 1920 school year. Uh, and so we were already headed down that path and we were absolutely thrilled that uh, the state has recognized the importance of pre-K and have, uh, have now funded full day pre-K. Uh, they have allowed uh, districts some discretion to phase that in a bit. Uh, so we will, in our district, be implementing full day pre-K at five schools this year 
and uh, then uh, intend to fully implement it the following year. Uh, but we, we will be working towards uh, the infrastructure uh, to support that program. And most of our schools will have uh, some amount of, uh, con of condition needs or addition uh, to fully support the program. Uh, everything from adding some bathrooms to individual classrooms uh, to classroom addition at some schools and then uh, adding furnishings, uh, appropriate size uh, and, and type of furnishings to all of our pre-K classrooms. So the dollars that are here are very specific to the needs of individual schools. We have quite a range from our, our newest schools that have um, um, our new standard of furniture for pre-K classrooms uh, to some much older buildings that uh, uh, have some older furnishings and uh, so and anything in between. And some schools, newer schools that have bathrooms in the classrooms, others that have no bathrooms in classrooms. So quite a wide range of need here. In terms of athletic improvements, uh, they fall in three kind of distinct categories. Um, we have uh, identified needs to, um, to renovate our existing two athletic fields, Wildman and Cravens fields. Uh, those are, are very basic type um, uh, improvements, including uh, locker rooms, uh, restroom improvements, concessions and ticket booths. Also replacing the field turf, you know, it has a life. And so uh, we need to replace field turf at uh, those fields and then resurfacing the tracks and replacing scoreboards and um, adding and upgrading to bleachers. Uh, we've also identified a need to uh, add a third competition stadium. You know, as we've had a great deal of discussion uh, in the past, uh, we currently rent UTA's uh, Maverick Stadium that facility will not be uh, available to us for much longer. And uh, so that effectively, without that, we, we um, remove a third of our capacity for serving um, our high schools uh, for uh, football and, and other competition. So um, we have uh, included dollars here and have a recommendation that we renovate um, one other existing high school field uh, to uh, be able to accommodate varsity uh, competitions. Uh, that would um, involve uh, adding seating at uh, the school we select. Uh, also parking would need to be added along with uh, the restrooms, uh, concession stands, and uh, ticket booth infrastructure uh, to support uh, that, that program. Uh, also uh, replacing turf and uh, resurfacing the track. All of our fields were, were turfed at the same times a number of years ago, uh, and so they're all due, all those fields are uh, needing to be replaced at the same time now in, within this next five years. The third bucket that uh, we have identified uh, is a, a distinct category of capital needs uh, are all the other areas, everything from um, locker rooms inside the buildings, restrooms, scoreboards, uh, gym renovations, uh, bleacher uh, repairs and renovations in the buildings, uh, resurfacing tennis courts, uh, adding lights uh, on the tennis courts, and uh, junior high concession stands and storage. There was a question, I think, at the uh, last meeting about, well, um, you know, how much are we spending on athletics? We pulled that out and showed you those dollars here, a uh, total of $76 million, and that includes uh, the renovations to those district level facilities, Cravens, Wildman, uh, creating the third competition field, and then also the softball complex. Uh, and then again, in the different color boxes on the right, uh, you can see the kinds of, um, of um, improvements that uh, we are making at each different grade level in different type of facility. We also had identified uh, a need across all of our schools, all of our high schools, um, to uh, improve our auditorium finishes. Uh, you know, we've made a significant investment in our current bond program uh, in upgrading auditoriums, and we focused on uh, lighting systems, sound systems, uh, and uh, curtains, and, and what have you. So this is more about uh, the house finishes, the lighting in the house, uh, carpet, the paint, uh, uh, in, in the house itself. We've also, in this current bond program, replaced uh, most of the auditorium seating. 
And so uh, that's something we've already taken care of. So what we've got here again uh, are the other house finishes that need to be upgraded. Uh, then various fine arts additions and renovations across all of our schools. Again, uh, the, um, the needs are specific to each campus based on the size of their program, the size of the space that they are in today, and the condition of those spaces. Uh, also, instrument storage has been a, a, a tremendous need in our growing program, so there are dollars here uh, to address that. In the area of career and technology, um, we have identified needs for renovations at uh, several of our high schools to ensure that each of the high schools has space for um, those entry-level courses so that um, students across all six schools um, have opportunity to take all the programs uh, that then matriculate into the Career Tech Center. And so right now we've got uh, several schools that don't have uh, appropriate construction labs or welding labs and kids in those schools actually are being bused um, to uh, primarily to the Ag Science Center to take those classes so that when they become juniors and seniors, they can move on uh, to the Career Tech Center for those courses. So again, uh, the question came up at the last meeting. Um, it was a, a, a question about both fine arts and athletics and what uh, kind of dollars were being spent on those areas. So just like you saw for athletics a minute ago, uh, here we pulled out uh, the fine arts piece and uh, you can see the dollars by campus. Again, the needs vary campus to campus, but you see the type of need explained here in the different uh, colored boxes. And so for fine arts, it totals up uh, $26.6 uh, million. We have uh, funding in the uh, proposal to replace playgrounds at uh, all of our elementary schools. Uh, the picture in the top right is a typical current playground uh, many of our schools still have. And the pictures across the bottom uh, represent um, our new standard uh, with um, the accessible play surface and also uh, ADA accessible equipment, not just access to the equipment, but the equipment itself is ADA accessible, and then canopies over those structures. A question was asked uh, also at the last meeting about lighting uh, and how much lighting was involved here, and so we pulled out the dollars in by school for those lighting uh, renovations and upgrades. It totals uh, a little less than $9 million, and I, I think I may have said this at uh, the last meeting, but uh, we've done a lot of lighting work over the years, really starting with the 2009 bond program. Every time that we have a chance to do something with lighting, we do. Uh, it, it's really amazing uh, the difference that uh, upgraded lighting makes in older buildings. And so we've, we've done a lot of that with the 2009 bond program, the 2014 bond program, and also through some uh, low interest loans that we've received through the State Energy Conservation Office. So um, these are lighting um, projects we've included in this bond program. There also are still others that we chose uh, that, to hold off on until potentially a, a next bond program. Because again, you know, we, we prioritized all of our needs into what we thought uh, uh, we could afford and needed most uh, for the next five years. So there are still other lighting projects uh, identified. Uh, these are the ones that uh, were prioritized uh, into uh, this current bond package. I will say a lot of the condition needs um, were based not just on the particular system itself, but uh, again, the building as a whole. So once we had identified all of the different uh, items that uh, needed to be upgraded or replaced entirely, all the individual systems, we also looked at the overall condition of buildings. And so we kind of tackled this in terms of um, uh, the, the overall needs of the building, the overall age of a building. So an older building, you will see, has uh, more condition needs included in this particular bond package than a newer building. Uh, so that was kind of how we went at uh, phasing some of the, the need. So that, uh, that's all of our, uh, the information we have here uh, specific to the facilities uh, recommendations. Uh, other areas, again, we covered these at the last meeting. I'm going to try to pare this down from what we discussed at the last meeting. Uh, in the area of safety, security, and technology, uh, we have needs totaling $97.1 million. And they, uh, those needs fall into four different uh, broad categories that you see listed here. 
Uh, Mr. Branham and his group have put uh, this together very nicely. Uh, the next several slides summarize what's in each of those buckets. Uh, infrastructure includes um, our network uh, systems, uh, and server replacements, uh, also a secondary data center. And uh, then this is where the security uh, uh, equipment is largely. Security camera replacements uh, and expanded uh, security camera coverage. Uh, also uh, the recording systems for the uh, security cameras. And then also uh, access control to all of our buildings. For the replacement schedule, we've replaced um, all of our uh, devices, our laptops and what have you, generally on a five-year schedule. And so uh, we've identified uh, those uh, replacement needs over the next five years, and they total $39 million across the district. That also includes copiers for all of our schools. In district standards, um, we have identified uh, close to $12 million of uh, need, ranging anywhere from a pre-K technology standard to outfit um, and equip our uh, expanded pre-K program. Uh, also, secondary calculators. And then expanded access uh, in all of our elementary libraries and uh, elementary fine arts programming. And then a strategic one-to-one. -one. We've had a lot of conversation. Uh, this bond, uh, the, the, in this capital needs assessment, uh, as well as the one we did in 2014 that uh, Mr. Wilbanks was uh, very much a part of, uh, about one-to-one -one where it makes sense. And we've taken the approach uh, with 2014 and again now uh, that um, it makes best sense and seems to represent the best, um, provide us all the best value uh, to do it on a very uh, targeted basis. And so uh, we've identified those programs uh, that uh, can benefit from a one-to-one -one type um, arrangement and have included dollars here for that. In the fine arts area, uh, again, uh, Dr. Anderson and, and his team um, had identified needs totaling about $7 million across a variety of categories. In the materials we sent to you all uh, for both you know, technology and, and fine arts, we gave you the detail uh, behind uh, all the, the summarized line items you see here. And so um, uh, in this particular um, area, we focused on several things, one being theater equipment, and then another being um, band and orchestra instruments, uh, focusing primarily on those artist level instruments for our top performing uh, ensembles. We've also captured here um, uh, the routine replacement uh, of uniforms and then also uh, needs for, um, uh, fine, uh, for visual arts. And that is something, as we've discussed before, that really was not provided for in the 2014 bond program. So we have some, some needs there. In the area of transportation, um, we have uh, included funds to uh, replace vehicles. Again, they have a life cycle. Uh, we, we generally um, look at a life cycle of 10 years for a bus. And then uh, we've also, so we've, we've factored in life cycle for, or I'm sorry, 12 years. And, uh, and so we've we factored in replacement of those buses that will reach the end of their lives in the next five years, along with uh, we have provided for uh, the additional vehicles that we need, additional buses, uh, additional activity uh, buses, shuttle buses. Uh, those are the small buses that we've begun buying just in the last couple of years that have helped us uh, transport kids during the day when we have small groups that need to move perhaps from a campus to the Ag Science Center uh, or a, um, a small uh, team or group of students that need to travel to uh, a competition of some sort. Uh, it's been very helpful to have these smaller buses available to us. And then also our service fleet, uh, all of our maintenance vehicles, uh, and warehouse vehicles in uh, the various departments that have uh, vans, service fleets. Uh, we've also provided for those needs. Uh, so all total, uh, we have included funds here to purchase 212 uh, various uh, types of vehicles, totaling about $15.5 million. Again, this brings us back to the slide summarizing the total at uh, $965.9 million. 
We've also uh, had some discussion at our last meeting um, about uh, items that uh, were deferred out of the initial recommendations to you all. Um, when, as we went into the fifth steering committee uh, meeting, we had uh, identified needs totaling about a uh, billion, five million dollars. And so the direction that we had, the, the uh, input that we had from the steering committee itself and also from uh, some of the community dialogues we had conducted indicated a, a strong desire uh, to keep the overall size of the proposal below a billion dollars. So as administration went back and worked with our consultants and we um, identified things, uh, again, looking at the data from the community dialogues uh, and different uh, uh, steering committee meetings, some things that possibly, if we had to make reductions, what, what could we um, uh, defer to potentially a future bond package? Uh, you see the, the list here. Um, this is where, for example, uh, we identified that, well, uh, maybe instead of replacing the entire service center, we could look at uh, phasing that in. So we took out uh, a portion of that. Uh, we also had, uh, had taken out of that um, uh, a, an addition to the Career Tech Center, uh, and also uh, softball fields are on here, and um, Ag Science Center additions, just among some of the other things that uh, were removed. We shared this uh, back with the board uh, to say these are things that uh, had been identified as uh, needs, uh, but in the overall picture of attempting to prioritize all those needs, these are things that, um, at least in the interim, we had, had you know, we, we thought could come out. Uh, we think that there's value in adding uh, at least a couple of these things back, and uh, we had a little bit of discussion about that at the last meeting. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have more discussion tonight. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in particular, uh, we've had continued discussion um, amongst uh, program staff and the instructional folks about uh, maybe what the opportunity of an addition of the, to the Career Tech Center could mean uh, to us in terms of programming going forward. Uh, there has been a desire to add a, um, a specialized health services uh, program at the high school level uh, at one of our traditional high schools. With a program like that, um, that uh, would necessitate some specialized space, including um, more science labs and more classroom space. Uh, this would be a program that would potentially operate like the STEM Academy at Martin uh, that would serve students from across the district. So uh, it would create a need for extra capacity at uh, wherever we choose to put this. Uh, so we've had a lot of discussion, and even in the last month, about um, is that a, uh, an item or an investment that could help us accomplish multiple things, including A, uh, the needs of that additional program, that uh, health sciences program, uh, and then also uh, help us um, uh, provide some additional capacity at the Career Tech Center, where, as we've seen, um, our enrollments are, are growing and uh, it's a good problem to have, uh, but uh, we are having to turn kids away in certain programs right now. And even in the area of welding, uh, we are operating uh, welding classes from 6.30 in the morning to 6.30 at night. So we do think that that one in particular is something that uh, uh, provides an, an opportunity to uh, address a couple of needs and provide additional program choices for students. That health sciences uh, program would be um, around a uh, uh, professional health services, uh, including uh, st for students who want to become nurses or doctors or uh, the professional path into the health services industry. Um, other things that I know have gotten some attention, uh, girls softball fields have been one. And so we think that uh, there are some things here that uh, the board may want to discuss. Uh, we have modeled uh, the total cost uh, of a bond program of this size. And what we know is that um, uh, we can uh, implement a bond program of the $965 million with no tax rate increase for at least five years. We also think we, or not think, we know that we have uh, a bit more capacity there. We could actually uh, increase that overall size and still be in the same position of not having to increase the tax rate. 
So I think if there's anything here that the board wants to consider potentially adding back, I think we've got some opportunity to do that um, and still be able to maintain um, uh, the tax rate where it is. There was a question asked at the last meeting um, about uh, the uh, annual operating cost or carrying cost, I think is the way it was uh, asked, uh, of these bond projects. So uh, we've gone back and we've calculated that and it's um, with uh, the, uh, the plan to close two elementary schools, that actually uh, generates some savings for us in terms of operating two more campuses. You know, every school has a principal, every school has a school secretary, a nurse, a librarian. So if you, if you have two fewer schools, you'll have two fewer principal positions, two fewer librarians, two fewer nurses, uh, two fewer custodial teams in those buildings. So you have some savings there and then certainly just the cost of operating the building, the utilities itself. So we have uh, some savings that um, we have identified uh, by uh, the proposed closing of Roark and Knox. And then you trade with that uh, the cost of uh, the new facilities you build. And so as we've looked at this, um, we've looked at, um, uh, if we, we've looked at everything from utilities, um, both the utilities will save, the utilities that will add in, in the case of Thornton and uh, Barry, we would propose building larger schools than exist today, so we've taken that into account on the utility uh, estimate. We also would anticipate that if we have a larger Thornton and a larger Barry, we may need an additional um, assistant principal in those schools and addition, additional uh, attendance clerks, so we've allowed for those. Um, at the uh, junior high and high school level where uh, we are proposing to add uh, fine arts, dual language academies, uh, we've worked with uh, Dr. Anderson and his team and also Dr. Wirtz uh, and uh, Patty Bustamante and Sandy Perez on the incremental positions that would be required for those academies. We put all of this together in the mix and actually what we come up with is a net increase of 10 FTEs and then the difference in utilities and operating costs. So uh, the total operating cost that we've estimated here is uh, just under $900,000. And we are assuming with these estimates uh, current dollars and that uh, all of those programs are fully um, online and uh, fully uh, implemented, the program itself, not just the facility. So it gives you a little background about how we, how we came to that. We saw this slide in our last meeting uh, as we plan this bond program. Uh, we planned uh, from what our programming needs are, what our instructional priorities are, and then uh, we programmed to, uh, to meet those needs. And so our expected outcomes uh, are that we would put more students in modern uh, facilities by replacing four older buildings. Uh, improved utilization of our facilities by closing schools where our enrollment trends tell us uh, we don't need that capacity. And we have uh, very aging facilities in the area. Also addressing everything from uh, condition needs, safety and security improvements, uh, providing uh, expanded early education programming through full day pre-K, uh, choice programs, and, and certainly in providing uh, increased access across um, uh, the district to various programs. Bonded debt is something that, I mean, obviously if uh, in, a, in a, what we're talking about here is a potentially a bond program to fund this. And so bonds are debt. And so we had some discussion at the last meeting about um, our current uh, debt position and what um, uh, the addition of, an, of another bond program might, um, what kind of impact that might have for us. So uh, we've shown you this chart uh, a couple of times. Uh, our current debt load is a little over a billion dollars. We actually have uh, uh, one of our uh, semi-annual payments is due August 15th, and so uh, then that will come down even further. Uh, but uh, you see in the, the chart on the right, um, our uh, debt, our current debt, the, the, the blue section is the principal, the gray section is uh, interest. And so you can see that um, uh, over the next uh, uh, 25 years, that debt declines dramatically. 
this is something we've worked at for many, many years in structuring our debt to match the, the useful lives of assets and uh, to look for any refunding opportunities that uh, we have along the way and structuring our debt in such a way that um, uh, we manage it so it does look like this and periodically as we have needs, uh, new needs uh, to fund, uh, we have the room uh, to issue new debt to take care of those needs. Our credit ratings uh, from both Moody's and S&P are the second highest categories that those uh, credit rating agencies offer, which is uh, very good. There are only a handful of school districts in Texas that uh, have that top uh, uh, credit rating. So I've got uh, two slides that are going to look similar, but uh, different uh, comparison groups. Uh, we included in your packet um, some uh, uh, spreadsheets that showed how we compare to uh, other districts in the state of Texas uh, in terms of debt. And it, uh, it's, it's a, those are spreadsheets with numbers on them and have a lot of information on them. We called out uh, two key points uh, on those spreadsheets to show you in a bar chart. So this particular one shows how we compare to other uh, large districts across the state. The chart on the left shows our debt today, our existing debt, as a percent of our taxable property value. Chart on the right shows our debt per student in average daily attendance. So you can see we, we compare very, very favorably to other sizable districts uh, across the state. This chart, same presentations, but uh, the, uh, the comparison groups here are the districts in the DFW area that have 20,000 or more students. And so again, uh, we are the light green uh, bar on both, uh, both slides here. And so you can see that, uh, that we compare very, very favorably in terms of debt load uh, to our um, neighboring districts. In terms of tax rates, um, uh, if you look at the current tax rates, the 2018 tax rates for all of the school districts in Tarrant County, there are 21 school districts. If you rank them from highest to lowest tax rate, uh, we are number 18 on that list. There are only three districts uh, in Tarrant County that have tax rates less than us. So uh, George Williford is, is here. Um, I'm actually going to, if he doesn't mind, I'm going to ask him to step up and kind of give his perspective of, of uh, how our debt situation is right now and uh, our capacity for um, adding to that debt load, if we want to. So, George. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. Dr. Reich and members of the board, uh, for the record, George Williford with Hilltop Securities. And... Uh, a lot of the information that Cindy just went over is very familiar. We'd also uh, provided additional kind of peer review information. One thing that I would state from our perspective is the debt that was shown there is a combination of principal plus interest as it stands now that would be payable over the life of that debt. And to me, it's just like when you incur a mortgage on your home, a 30-year mortgage, if that's a $200,000 principal or that's what you borrowed to actually purchase the house, you typically don't think in terms, well, I really owe uh, or have a 400000 nearly mortgage. You think of the principal amount. So that's what we uh, tend to focus on, and that's what all the comparative data is based on uh, as well. And so as it stands, uh, Arlington ISD has $766 million, uh, slightly over that, of principal uh, outstanding. You've got a fairly accelerated uh, retirement uh, of that principal, at least over the next several years, and that's based, uh, and because of the way the district has been very disciplined about structuring debt, that the technology has a very short payoff some of the other assets have uh, short payoffs relative, like Cindy said, to the buses. Uh, 12 years, there's some 10-year assets and so on. So for the next five years, for example, each year uh, the district pays off 41 to 49 million of principal uh, each and every year. And the reason uh, that I mention that is uh, uh, we had helped generate these two uh, uh, peer comparisons and first, the one that are, is the uh, districts within the four surrounding counties, Tarrant, Dallas, Collin, and Denton, 
Uh, there are 18 districts in addition to uh, Arlington ISD. And like I said, you have 766 million in principal outstanding as it stands. <coughs> Out of those 18 other districts, five have debt right now, or that's authorized and about to be issued principal uh, over a billion two. Uh, and so also, if you were thinking of 965 million to be issued over a five year period, in addition to the 766 that you have, over that five years, like I said, you're gonna retire 220,000 of principal. So uh, it's not like uh, a billion seven, literally, of debt you'd have at uh, the end of that five years, it'd be more like a billion five or thereabouts. So uh, that's not an uncommon uh, position to be in. Of the uh, 10 peer districts that, the, uh, uh, that Arlington ISD uses around the state, out of those 10, six have uh, debt existing right now over a billion dollars. And what's really uh, important, I think, from your perspective is as it stands, just like Cindy pointed out on those graphs, uh, among the 20 or 19 districts within the Fort County area, you're the third lowest in terms of debt uh, as a percentage of assessed value, and also third lowest in terms of debt uh, per capita. Uh, and, and per capita, that's based on enrollment uh, and so on. And you actually have the second lowest, as I saw it, uh, total tax rate. The districts that are uh, the 10 districts within the state uh, on those same two metrics, you actually have the lowest debt as a percentage of assessed value uh, among all of those districts. And you're the fourth in terms of debt uh, per enrollment. So uh, in our view, and working with a number of districts uh, in the Metroplex and other parts of the state, uh, the district's debt burden is not uh, at all out of line, wouldn't be at all out of line with what's being discussed. And like I said, with the uh, amortization that you already have in place and the way the new uh, issue as we've been working with Cindy and Tony is modeled, uh, you'd continue to have that very rigorous retirement of principal uh, and so on. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions uh, or prepare anything else that you all might like to see relative or related to that. I appreciate you being here tonight, Mr. Wilfred, and, and uh, the analysis and the information. Uh, are there trustees that have questions? Looks like there is. Uh, Mr. Wilbanks, please. Uh, it didn't work, sorry. Yeah, how quickly I forget. There you go. Thank you for compiling this data. This is very helpful, I think, for us in our decision that we have here. Um, just a few questions. On the first slide where you showed the total outstanding debt of being over just over a, mil, um, a billion, you said we've recently just paid down a big payment and that we're at currently at 760 well, what, mil, million? The, the number on the graph was a combination. Combination of principal and, and interest. interest. And on that graph, the principal component was 766. Now you did pay down a, a large principal payment during this fiscal year. The principal retired was $58 million. So it was like $820 million outstanding uh, for the okay. fiscal year. So I, not to put you on the spot, but I, I assume in these charts, that is based on our current debt load. Yes, sir. And if we were to add, um, let's say it was you know currently a, a billion outstanding, uh, and we were to add a billion, so that would pretty much double our debt as a percentage of taxable property rate, and that would would correct me if I'm doing the math wrong, but that would put us more like Allen or Birdville, kind of in, in that range. Kind of below Grand Prairie, but around Birdville, is, would that be a good guess of kind of the range we'd be at after? We'd have to run it to be exact, but in our view, being at literally the low end or third lowest in both of the metrics as it stands, uh, the addition, and when we factor in the pay down as that debt's coming on, uh, would probably put you more in line with the median measures of those uh, Coming right in the middle of that chart. Somewhere. Okay. That's the only question I had, so I appreciate that. 
Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilbanks. Uh, I have a question as far as the large DFW districts, why Dallas was not included? We didn't really discuss. We, we went through 20, and, and I don't know if they're not considered necessarily comparable because of their position. Yeah, so I think on that chart, um, it was uh, all districts over 20,000. I think that was just left off, uh, and there was not a specific purpose on that. When you look at the statewide uh, comparison of peer districts, uh, we gave those particular districts uh, to right. Hilltop, and we use the districts uh, that we tend to use uh, for all of our budget purposes that look more like us, so we would not put a Houston or a Dallas or something like that. So I think maybe because of that, the um, uh, it was also not on the, the local one. Uh, but uh, And we can add that in and, and present that to you all. One thing I, I would point out, uh, too, um, is that, um, you know, we don't issue all the debt at one time. Uh, you know, you issue debt uh, over the life of the bond package. And so um, as you're issuing that debt, you're also paying off um, existing debt. And so that helps you as you um, uh, manage the debt load. When we talk about um, holding, being able to hold the tax rate constant, we think for five years at least, that is uh, using some very conservative assumptions on property value growth. And so we have uh, factored in, I think it's 5% uh, estimated growth for the first year out, 4% the year after that, and then I think there are two or three years where we used 3%, and then I think five years where we assumed a 2% growth, and then a 1%, and then the majority of years out to the 25th year, are at, um, uh, I think, a half percent estimated uh, growth in property values. So those uh, assumptions that we use and that we give to Hilltop to build those models um, are very, very conservative. And so we found that to, to be very helpful in, in the past. Um, and uh, so that's something that, um, that, that we've done again here. So just And I might add another level of conservatism is the interest rates we're using. And I can't make any promises about where rates are going to be, you know, five years down the road. But what we're projecting, for example, for the, if there was an election passed and we issued early in 2020, uh, the interest rate's 475, and that's easily 100 basis points over current market rates. Then when you get into the subsequent issues, as we've got them modeled, they're five and a quarter and five and a half. So we're, we've got literally on the long end 200 basis points of cushion in the modeling. Very good. Uh, don't go too far. There are uh, other other questions. Um, Mr. Chapa, please. Whoop. Hold on, I'll get you back here. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, this question is probably more for Ms. Powell, but I just want to make clear that I'm understanding correctly that when we say that we're not projecting a tax rate increase for at least five years, that doesn't mean that we're going to, we're, we're planning on there being a tax rate increase in year six. It's just that's what we have forecast. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We have, and, and <laughs> actually, it begins to go down. Again, because our debt is we pay it down um, and our property values stay the same or go up. Uh, that tax rate will actually drop off after that point. Now, by the time we get to that point, we may be having another discussion to determine if we have additional needs that warrant a next bond package. Sure. And that's why we work very hard at uh, keeping that debt so that um, uh, we leave room in, in future years to add additional in if you need it. Thank you. I just want to make that clarification because yeah, I can a, just see somebody seeing point. that and be like, oh, they said they don't, you know, not for five years, but yeah. and, you know, I think we're very comfortable in saying there will not be a tax rate yes. increase with this. Yes. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chop and Mr. Wilbanks. Kind of on the lines of your question about Dallas, I do want to point out rumor has it that they're going out with a $2 billion plus in the same time frame that we're looking at. So um, I'd be curious to see what their data looks like knowing that they're going to be going out with that big of, of bond package. Very good. Any other questions for Mr. Wilford? Thank you, George. Appreciate it. All right. And uh, before you continue, Ms. Powell, uh, so uh, not suggesting that we're, we're going there, but without increasing the tax rate, you've pretty much calculated out 
up to a billion dollars that there's no change or is it 985 or what is I, I'm sorry can you repeat that uh, th to have no tax rate increase um, which was one of the goals you know less than a billion but how much less than a billion or is it right at a billion what, where did, where is that lever what we've modeled um, at, at the moment the most recent model it includes one that is a billion and we did another one just over a billion um, I would say at a billion we could still do it without a tax rate increase is what the model has just wanted to be clear thank you okay please continue okay. All right, uh, so thank you, Mr. Uh, Williford. Uh, so the uh, next item that I wanna touch on is our follow-up bond awareness survey. Uh, Mr. Turco, Ray Turco and Associates um, is here this evening and, and he'll go through his slides. Um, as you all well know, he conducted a survey for us in the spring, an initial bond awareness survey. At that time, we were also anticipating uh, the need that, uh, to have a tax ratification election or TRE this fall at the same time. And so that survey was uh, quite expansive and um, on the bond side, it was a little more conceptual. Uh, and so um, with this follow-up survey, what we were able to do is uh, use the more specific information coming from the recommendations presented to the board uh, on June 25th. And so uh, this uh, survey was performed in much the same way as the first one was. And uh, so uh, Mr. Turco here is here. He is going to go through his slides. Good evening, Mr. Turco. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'd like to take as brief a time as I can to kind of review the survey, talk a little bit briefly. We did a survey in January. We wanted to make a follow-up survey. We've done this here in Arlington in previous bond elections. Not often, but we've used this tool to come back and see if there's areas that we didn't, weren't able to look at specifically in the initial bond survey to kind of drill down and to focus on what might be better, things we might have missed previously. So the recommendation was made back in January, January and the district said that would be a good thing to look at. So that's what we were doing. And what I do, turn it off? Probably. Is that button? There you go. I'm sorry. You've gone to the end here. It up. That's all right. Um. There we go. Yeah, let me get back to the. Okay, it's all done. I'll answer any questions right now. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Turco. <laughs> okay, which one? Which button? That, that button. All right. All right. So how did we do the survey? Similar to the, what we did in January, we did 402 randomly selected voting households. One slight difference is in this survey, we included people who had voted in the May uh, City Council School Board election. So we, it was slightly different. We used the six high school network zones as we've done before. So what we wanted to do was to have a valid sampling by network. So in other words, if Sam Houston uh, network represents 30% of the historical voters, then 30% of the surveys were completed there. We just didn't take six areas, divide it by 100% and go from that way. The field work took place in July, and what we found, looking at the district profile, we had a much younger sample, which I thought was very good. You'll note that previously we had 22% of the sample was under the age of 45. This year it was only 10% in January, now it's only 22%. 75% and 47% were over the ages of 55 and over the ages of 65 back in January. This time it was only 59% we're over the age of 55 and 35%. So we still have an older sample, okay, because those are the people most likely to vote. People who are older, whose kids are not in school. So, but we had less. 46% had children in AISD schools or had graduated in the past five years. 61% had no children in school. Previously, we were at 42%, 64, and 4%. So it's pretty similar. In terms of the grade level, 
11% of the people had uh, kids at the elementary school level, 5% at the junior high level, and 11% at the high school level. In January, one of the items we looked at very closely was trying to determine thresholds. In other words, at which point people want, did, weren't, weren't going to support something based simply on the amount. And we talked about looking at various areas. So at that time, 800 and 900 million for facility maintenance and life cycle improvements was the threshold that voters were open to. 300 to 400 million for construction and renovation, 100 to 200 million for safety, security, and technology. So at that point, the threshold was between 1.2 and 1.5 billion dollars. Then we had said, if an election were held today, how strongly would you support or oppose a bond election of approximately $1 billion? And we listed the primary areas in which it would be talked about. We said, at that point in the pretest, in other words, the time where we hadn't given them any information, hadn't spoken about any of the general recommendations that we were looking for, we had 58% support and 35% opposition. Later in the survey, after we had explained what we were looking at, some of the tax ramifications, some of the other items, we generated from, went from 58% to 65% support. So the information that we gave through the survey generated an increase in the support among voters. So we felt pretty good at that time. I came and reported and I said, right now if there were a bond election, the, board, the voters of the school district would support it. At the time we did it, the top tier, rec re the top tier recommendations were renovations and improvements, the new junior high school to replace Carter Junior High, and the two elementary schools to replace Webb and Thornton. The lower tier items were upgrading the stadiums, and you'll see that only generated 41% support at that time. Uh, replacing the 60-year-old service center at 63%, constructing the one or two pre-K centers and classroom additions to offer full-day pre-K at 68%. Well, obviously now things have changed. A lot of decisions were made. Yes, there is no more TRE election. The tax ramifications uh, that are being played into part. So in this time, the very, nearly the very first question we asked was, if an election were held today, how strongly would you support a bond election of approximately $970 million to construct our items? Construction, improvements, life cycle, safety, transportation, fine arts, and everything. And we jumped to 70% support. So without giving them any information, the, the, <clears throat> what has been disseminated from the district from January through July has caused support to continue to improve, to continue to increase. So the efforts of the steering committee, the efforts of the district, the efforts of the board have all positively influenced support to improve and to increase. I think that's very beneficial. You have 44% strong support. So in other words, more people went to the very extreme to say, I'm very supportive than even what we call our soft support, so our general kinds of things. You'll note our strong opposition is 16%. So it's separated to the point where there's not a lot of middle. Those people who are opposed are strongly opposed to it. So it's not, there's not a, going to be a lot of swaying, but those people who are positive about it are extremely positive about it. If we look at some of the very different variables, you'll see strong supporters of the bond election are, very, are all in. Supporters are at 78%. Opponents are not supportive. But our undecided people are at double the support. Now, the orange numbers were when we did the survey in January. So you'll note undecided voters from January through July have seen numbers go up from 14% to 46% support. So we've improved much um, amongst the undecided voters. Parents, numbers stayed similar. We increased just a little bit. 
parents of graduates, you'll see we went from 63% to 77%. But amongst non-parents, people who don't have kids in school and who represent a large block of who's going to vote when the election comes, we went from 54% to 69%. So we improved 15% from January pretest to July pretest. Well, then we had a list of about nine various items. Some of them were similar from uh, January, some of them were not. Construction of three new elementary schools to replace Barry, Webb, and Thornton. We had 84% back in January when we were only looking at two schools, we had 71%. Building age-appropriate playgrounds, that was a new item. That was not on the survey uh, back in January. That generated 84%. Renovating classrooms and construct several additions at elementary schools. It was a little bit different. Back in January, we went from 68% to 83%. Renovations and improvements at all schools. That was the same pretty much from the last survey. That went from 77 to 82%. So all of our items generated additional support. Our lower tier items, Closing Rourke and Knox Elementary Schools to replace Barry, Webb, and Thornton. That was a new item. It generated 60 per 66%. It was the least popularly supported item, uh, but still with two out of three people who would do it. Replacing the district's 60-year-old transportation and security offices. Slightly different language, but we went from 63% upwards of 72%. Offering district-wide fine arts dual language academy programs at Gunn Junior High. That was a new item and we generated 75% support. Construction of a new junior high to replace 60-year-old Carter Junior High. We went from 72% to 80%. Remodeling and renovations at all junior high and high school campuses to upgrade programs. It's slightly different language, but we still went from 69% to 82%. Previously, in January, the question was looked at whether or not to upgrade Weileman and Cravens Fields, and that was pretty much about it, and other athletic fields, and that did not generate uh, popular support. So this time what we did is we focused on the actual recommendations of the committee, because we had them at those points. And so when we presented it that way, to, to support improving Weileman and Cravens Field and converting a high school field into another competition field, okay? We generated 57% support, 23% strong support, 34% general versus 38% uh, opposition. Now, one thing you will note is that the intensity ratings from both sides of the issue are the same, are pretty similar. So there are people opposed to it, as much as people who strongly support this item strongly oppose this item. Then what we did is we said, okay, let's give you some information relative to this item to see if it impacts your decision. So how likely or unlikely would you choose to support this based on this information? And we noted the number one item was the district feels it makes better economic sense to upgrade three existing fields than construct a new football stadium. It was more important than all the other items. The district will soon be unable to rent UTA Stadium, Maverick Stadium, and must make up for the loss of the facility. That generated 68% likely support. Our student athletes deserve to play in a quality facility, 68%. The areas being improved were built 45 years ago at 65%, and the fields are over 45 years old and in need of upgrades. So the items that were of least importance were the age of the structures. So in other words, as information is generated relative to improving those fields, you're going to find more, you're gonna influence people more by saying it makes much more economic sense to upgrade these fields rather than building a new $78 million stadium that doesn't do a whole heck of a lot, rather than focusing, well, these buildings are 45 years old and in need of improvement. But each of those did influence people to vote for it. So we felt really good about being able to give that information. And once the information campaign begins, uh, to be able to disseminate that. Then we went and said, OK, 
how likely or unlikely would you be to support a bond election of nearly a billion dollars based on this information? The number one items were the bond funds would provide improvements for specialized programs, including career and technical and fine arts dual language that made 81% likely to vote for it. The district would be able to implement state required full day pre-K uh, for eligible families, slightly different, slightly different language. We improved uh, 7% and the new school renovations and modern learning spaces will improve operating efficiencies at 76%. Then we said if this were the least influential ones, if approved, this bond election will have an impact on every single school in the district. At 76%, it was 71% before. Most of the funds proposed would go to build new schools, classroom additions. It was 65% before at 73% at this point. Uh, based on property values and a decline in existing debt, the district can afford a 970 million bond package with no increase in the debt service tax rate. 69%. So if you think about this, what the voters were least influenced by was the fact of people telling them there wasn't going to be a tax increase. They were more influenced by the benefits, more so than the fact. Now, not to say that 70% that is a low number. That's a very high number. It's, it's when you're looking at you know, 10 items, you're always going to have the highest item and you're going to have the lowest item. But amongst these items, the lowest item at the 69% was, well, just want to let you know, you know, districts and people oftentimes say, well, we're not raising tax rates. And a lot of times people don't look at tax rates because they're not seeing their tax bill. And their tax bills are going up. So oftentimes it may not be to say, we're not going to increase your tax rate for the next five years because they're looking more at some of the benefits that are going to be garnered. So I thought that was very interesting as we, as we got into that. Then what we did is a little bit differently. We didn't do this in the original survey because we had to focus also some questions on the TRE, which we didn't have to this time. We gave them some statements to kind of examine some opinions. It's important our campuses be as safe as possible. Obviously, that was the most important one, 95%. Basically, everybody agreed to that. I will support because items in the package will help the district meet the needs of all students. 80% agreed with that statement. I will support the bond election because my tax rate will not increase. 73% said they would agree with that statement. I will oppose a bond election because I think $970 million is too much money. 38% agreed with it. So there are people out in the district that, that have that opinion, but more people disagreed with that and said they would not oppose it because $970 million is too much money. I will oppose because I not, do not support the items as presented. 25% agreed, 71% disputed it. I will oppose because I oppose the district closing Rourke and Knox Elementary. In other districts, the closing of schools has been very, uh, very critical. And we did work previously in the Wichita Falls ISD in which the bond elections failed on several occasions because people looked at closing their neighborhood schools and took that as the district not meeting their needs. So I was interested in that question to, to be able to look at that. It's not an issue. It's an issue to some, but it's not an issue to the majority. So then after we've asked all these questions, we came back and once again said, if an election were held today, how strongly would you support or oppose a bond election of approximately $970 million? You'll see we had, we went from 72%, we went down to 70%. So that support throughout the survey with all the information we gave them pretty much uh, maintained itself. I don't know at some point how you can continue when you've got opposition. You know, there's got to be a point when that number kind of stops a little bit. I mean, we went from from 54% upwards to 70%. So I feel very good about that. Strongly oppose again, undecided at 3%. So you had a ratio of nearly three to one. So we're gonna to talk to three people and generate their support before anybody opposes uh, the election. If we look at some of our uh, ratios, kind of compare some of the voters. Voters overall, you'll see from the pre-test in the January or in the July survey, to the post-test, yes, we did improve a little bit. You'll see people who were undecided. We made some great gains there. 
parents improved, uh, non-parents improved. When we asked people who opposed the bond election, if they were opposed because of the amount of the package or if they were opposed to something else, 34% opponents said they were opposed to the amount. And we've seen that throughout the survey. Opposed to all of it, a, a few people, 14% of our 24% sample. Opposed to a specific area, 14%. Uh, do not trust the AISD, 10%. And opposed until the actual proposal are reviewed at 7%. Then people who were the, over the age of 65, we said, you know your taxes will not be improving unless you improve the, the standards of your house. Knowing this information, how likely or unlikely <clears throat> would you be to support a bond election? 71% uh, said they would. Back in January, that number was 62%. So that number's increased and improved. The unlikely stayed about the same because the refused to answer the undecideds uh, went down. So our ratio improved. So looking at some of the conclusions to the survey, the follow-up survey, support for a bond election pre-test and post-test for both surveys grew from 58% upwards of 70%. So the information from the beginning of the survey all through the planning stages was positive and people looked at it and said we're even more supportive than we were before. Most supportive of constructing the new elementary schools as well as the age-appropriate pl playgrounds. They were least supportive of closing of the elementary schools and replacing the transportation and the security offices, albeit with 66 and 72% support. 57% would support improving the football fields and renovating one high school field. They are most influenced by the economics of upgrading the three existing fields and their impact or the inability to uh, rent UTA stadium in the future. Most influenced to support because funds would provide improvements to specialized programs, the ability of the district to implement the state required full day pre-K, and the new school renovations and modern learning spaces will improve efficiencies. They were least influenced by the no increase in the debt service tax rate. They most affirm the need for safety and package helping meeting the needs of all students. They disputed the opposition on the three statements that we tested, the amount of the package, the items presented, and the closing of the two elementary schools. Um, as we go through the survey, all of the items were very popularly supported. And it seems to me we've had discussions uh, relative to an actual package. And the, per the information presented in the survey and the findings in the survey show that a single item package is, would be more advantageous, I believe, than, than others. We worked with a lot of districts in terms of looking at one item packages, putting the items together, looking as the bond, looking at a survey that while all the items were supported, if we go back and pull something out, there's a possibility that that numbers may change. I think I related to you back in January where we had worked in uh, McAllen and all of their items were for improving current facilities and the survey that we did at that point said we're for it but then after the survey was done the board had decided that they wanted new construction and kind of left what the survey had explored and tried to use the numbers from the survey to say, okay, this will pass, and it all failed. So uh, with that, are there any questions that I might be able to answer? Thank you very much uh, for the uh, analysis of your uh, work, um, Mr. Turco. There are some trustees that have questions. First up is Mr. Hogg. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reich. Ms. Turco, good to see you. It's been Thank a few you years. Much. Now, once again, you guarantee these numbers that voters are going to vote this way, right? I'm totally kidding. Don't answer that, Mr. Turco. Well, without, without guaranteeing <laughs> this district, based, I, I'm not going to give up. My, I can't take all the credit, but there, there's never been a bond election since, the la, since they needed to improve the football field at Wileman, and they didn't want to have artificial turf, turf on the track. Uh, Every bond election has passed. And I've done a survey for the district every time, and they've always been successful. So while I won't guarantee it, 
I feel pretty good. And you've been with us since 99 or so around there. You've been doing this with us before the 84. 84. I was a first grader when Mr. Turco started. So. <laughs> I appreciate it, Mr. Turco. It's I always right. felt like we had nice facilities, so good work on that. Um, Mr. Turco, help me understand in 2014, are we going off my memory? I feel like we're pretty similar on some of those results um, five years ago when we were doing this last The time. numbers, if I remember correctly, the numbers were lower. I don't recall us having the degree of support that we did before. Were they in the high we had major We had majority support at that point. I might say it was even below 60. Yeah. I could go back and look. I mean, I have the I have the data back. Yeah, I, I think it'd be nice if you all sent us out just to help me refresh and help compare off our experience. You know, doing sense. one in, you know, this district had gone a long time without doing a bond from 99 to 09. And 09, after a recession, it was a different bond. It was a very small bond. And then uh, we took some bold steps. It had a lot of different items in the 2014 bond versus this one. So I would be interested in seeing that data just – this old, pre honestly, this presentation, if you still have it from 2014, would help help me just to look. Don't don't recreate I can anything. Give you, I mean, I can provide you provide Cindy. I believe I have the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, that, that's that. all. I, but if not, I certainly have all the all sure. the data. It, it, don't recreate anything. Just inquiry minds. Thank you. That's all I had. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Hug. Uh, Mr. Chapa. I just I just have a couple of questions, and I just I'm going to make some sort of general statements and then see if you, you think it's a fair statement to make. So based on, and I'm looking at the slide, it says comparing bond support ratios by subsets, pre-test and post-test. Would it be fair to say that the people who are opposed to the bond package, it really doesn't matter what type of educating we do, according to this, their stance does not change? Pretty much, yes. I would agree with that. And then for people who are truly undecided, the educating them actually makes it quite a bit of difference correct in a positive direction correct okay and then the only other question I have is you know if you could look into your crystal ball and kind of make a some sort of prognostication about why the level of support increased between the two surveys so much what would you attribute that to I think I, what I would attribute it to is that any information that's been disseminated from the district or from any new sources or anything of that nature as it started, as they've gone through the meetings, uh, that information has been positive. I would suspect that people talking with other people has been positive. Uh, there hasn't been any negative, you know, sometimes when we do a survey, we like to make sure that there's not information that might skew somebody's opinion some negative uh, item that happens. There hasn't been any negativity around, and I think people are just adjusted to the fact that there are needs and that they are more supportive. So it would be fair to say that the, the, the Capital Needs Steering Committee process and the, the process of going out into the community and getting feedback multiple times, you feel like that process had an impact on educating the public as to what is going to go in here. Yes. All right. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Mr. Turco, I, I bet you would like to have a, a dime for every time somebody's asked you to look into the crystal ball or guarantee something, because I'm sure you've heard a lot of that over the course of time. I don't see any more lights indicating questions for you at this time, so uh, thank you very much again for the information. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That uh, pretty much brings us to the end. Uh, this uh, particular slide just shows us uh, kind of the timeline uh, that we have to work with. Uh, if we think that uh, we want to call an election for November to uh, fund the capital needs that have been presented to the board, uh, the legal deadline to call the election for November 5th is August 19th. Uh, obviously, we have a a regular board meeting on the 8th where we can continue these discussions, but uh, ultimately by the 19th, uh, if we're going to call the election, uh, we, the board would need to formally order that election. So uh, with that, uh, that is a, a lot of information, but uh, we'll be happy to, to answer any questions you have. Very good. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Ms. Powell. I uh, am certain that there will be a lot of discussion and questions at this point. We'll start with Mr. Hogg. Thank you, Dr. Reich. Ms. Powell, just a couple of quick questions on this. And thank you for the follow-up information that we needed from the June meeting. That, that helps me a lot, especially increased recurring cost, 881. And I assume that's taken into account the savings from that lighting renovations that we have. Is that also taken into account savings from maintenance and workers' comp? And things we save. We don't get uh, that specific, like uh, the the variation in the lighting, uh, because that gets real uh, uh, complicated to uh, project. So that's additional savings not reflected here. Anytime we upgrade and, but the just real quick, most of that lighting is going taking our old, you know. No, yes. on bulbs inefficient right. to the LEDs and things right. of that age, and, and so whether it's the lighting or whether it's even upgrading HVAC systems, that probably generates the bigger more. savings. Uh, we didn't in 2014 try to um, factor in savings from that, uh, uh, nor did we this time. But uh, so those would be additional efficiencies uh, not yet reflected here. So that's hoping, helping hopefully drive that cost down yes. to anyone and, and not even accounting because half the lighting renovation is workers comp, less maintenance work. They're able to do other maintenance requests. It's not less maintenance workers, it's other maintenance work around the district instead of replacing a light bulb. Ms. 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 Paul Walton, you know how sometimes teachers, sometimes I feel like teach in the dark in the old light days of lighting. So uh, anything to that. Let me. They all start going out. I oh, know. I had a front porch light bulb go out, and it took me three months to change it. So my wife reminded me daily. Um, Ms. Powell, let me ask. You, you talked about this health program and added in. That I have to assume that's not included in this bond, correct? Not at the moment. It is not. It's a program we've been having some discussion around, um, and... Uh, you know, th these things are never static. And so as we progressed even through the spring and in recent months uh, and, and uh, continuing to plan forward, uh, trying to anticipate uh, additional choice program offerings is where uh, we've yeah, come and, to that. And our continued uh, discussion with university partner and community college partner and how we can increase opportunities knowing that there's a lot of demand on the health sciences from our students wanting to join those programs but also other levels of health sciences that we can be offering through specialized learning at, at particular uh, schools. And in this case, this would allow that integration to happen and allow some capacity to be added to uh, the center that is already in need of capacity. And Dr. Passos, you know, we've, I know there's ideas floating of future academies, future specialized programs. None of that's included in this currently at, at this time, correct? So, so for clarity. Um, I know expansions, but like, I know Ms. Baldwin said expansions. I know expansions are in there. Right, but, but for clarity, such as Thornton, Webb, potentially would open as dual language as well. So okay. those are part of the discussions okay. with this, this program that it would be the uh, similar model as Crow and Piercy, where they, that would be the school for the students in that area. But we would also add students that are interested in dual language, for example. Uh, so those are being but considered. Dual language is a pretty low, not a giant cost of renovations of buildings and things like that. Correct. It's Correct. more okay. programmatic. However, Thornton and Webb will allow us through a new facility to have more capacity to, be able to, to serve students. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, and this may be back to Dr. Cavazos or Ms. Powell. You can answer either one um, or anyone else who can answer it. So we're adding, and I fully agree with adding the playgrounds. Um, I know we've done some beta tests. Should we assume if we're adding and enhancing our playgrounds, does that mean we're increasing the recess time at campuses? Because I know we've done. <laughs> what? I'm going to let Dr. Just, Dr. just a question. <laughs> just a question that I know a lot yeah. of parents have the, yeah, want so, that answer to. Uh, so, look, Dr. Wirtz is looking at me. He yeah, gave me the he eye. Wants, over he wants there. me to answer it. But <laughs> <laughs> so, in in reality, it is part of our uh, integrated plan. So with the facilities such as covered playgrounds and things like that accessible, it is something we continue to explore. Yeah. The issue is time, obviously, and, and the amount of time. But we are doing some tests on that, whether it helps students in terms of learning. And we know that it does, but to what extent? Uh, and so that will all be something that will continue to be considered with new facilities and accessible facilities 
and scheduling and different programs that we offer in our elementaries. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Bossos. And let, let me ask, um, the full day pre-K, I was a little shocked. I mean, it didn't score bad, but it didn't score as high as I thought it would score on some of those. And that's approximately $43 million. I'm assuming that cost when you bundle it to start, Ms. Powell, you're including that as our total elementary cost. Is that kind of the packages where it's bundled under? We're, or we're assuming pre-K is under elementary. It is, so it is. And, and I'll point out that part of that $43 million includes um, uh, rebuilding some gyms at uh, schools. There were a number of cases where um, as we looked at the pre-K renovations needed or additions, uh, we bundled that with replacing an elementary gym because in, in case of additions, in some cases, that gym was sitting on ground that we needed for uh, the actual addition. So the 43 million includes, and I've got the number here, but 10, 10, uh, the 43 million includes 10 gyms. Okay, thank you. Um, and my last question to anyone, um, Dr. Vassos, Ms. Walton, or Ms. Ms. Walton. <laughs> you can answer it also if you want, Ms. Walton, Ms. Powell. Um, I, I appreciate the idea of stadium renovations and doing that and adding a third um, to en enhance that. Um, one of the things that rated really high and stadiums didn't rate that good is safety. Would we have be willing to assume that a stadium renovation increases our safety at our place where we have the most people at one given time um, with this day and age of, unfortunately, the day and age we face of mass casualties, a our largest areas where we have the most people, I would just hope that that includes a huge amount of security renovations and, and the way we redesign them helps enhance our security on that. Is it that? Would, it would, there's a number of different uh, elements that, that would be included in that, but fencing around the properties would be one element. Um, we would also work with uh, Mr. Stevens and the security department to place cameras at other locations. Perfect, that that's what I wanted to hear. Higher locations different vantage points for from uh, press boxes and things like that. So, um, and then we would also make improvements to our, our excess points, you know, into the stadium that would also help us with that as well. That's what I needed to hear. Thank you. Well, and, and even lighting in the parking lots, I mean, lighting is, is bundled up, not specifically with the um, uh, field renovations, but in the campus condition work. So we've been very mindful of trying to place additional lighting, better lighting on the exterior of our campuses. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Hogg. Uh, Mrs. Mays, I will call on you and we appreciate and respect your uh, condition right now. Sorry I was hitting you, <laughs> but you're not you right now, you're me over there. On the left there. side, hit me on the left side. <laughs> hit me on the left side. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I have a lot of very positive things to say, um, but I guess I can wrap it up since I can't say a lot is um, one thing to piggyback off of you, Mr. Tucker, thank you very much. I think another reason why um, we're getting positive responses from the community, and I've said this before, is because the trend that we've set with our prior bond programs in doing what we said we would do, spending the money as we said we would spend it, being efficient, being on time, and then the outcomes that we've seen from being able to spend that money from the success of our students. I think that's a huge factor too, so that makes me very proud. Um, and I would not have missed this night, no matter what was going on in my mouth, because this is very important to me, um, because I think it is still um, a huge benefit for our students in being able to expand a lot of the things that we've started doing um, in addition to the things that we want to do. So I just have a couple of clarification questions. On slide number six, um, titled Total Bond by Category. Yes. For the section Other, um, that dollar amounts 172,335,000. Should it be 219? Um, let's see here. Or is there something else? Yeah. 
Uh, I think you're right. I think that that should have been labeled differently. I think proportionately it's uh, right. Okay. But I think uh, the the label there may be. Okay, just want to make sure there's nothing we're missing. And then on slide 20. Um, playground mm -hmm. replacements and or uh, additions for the canopies is great. This we're planning to do um, with all the elementary schools. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, at our newest schools, uh, I think even the equipment doesn't meet the standard. I think there's uh, at least one that has a canopy mm -hmm. that has been donated uh, that, uh, that uh, might still suffice, uh, but the equipment at all of them and the surface at all of them uh, will be replaced. Okay. With standard? Uh-huh. Okay, up to standard. Yes. Okay. Um, and then last question on slide 21. Um, key elementary, is there a particular reason why their interior lighting is half of all the others? Well, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, we look for opportunities to do lighting work. Um, I'd have to go back and check, but uh, my assumption is we've already done some lighting improvements at Key uh, through uh, either a SECO loan that we had or a prior bond program. And that is a, it's a smaller building anyway, so. Okay, okay so he, uh, Mr. Warren says we've done lighting in this current bond program at Key, so. Very good. Um, and those are my only questions. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Ms. Mays. Uh, Ms. Walton, please. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Reich. Well, um, I had a follow-up question uh, on the uh, slide 20, the uh, playground uh, re replacement and that sort of thing. And it made me uh, think about an article I saw earlier this summer about the study that TCU and Dr. Ray are doing, and I think we're involved in that. And uh, any idea when we might get a report on that? Yeah, her, uh, I think the last time uh, Words, you may want to weigh in on this, but I think her last assessment was that it was trending in the right direction and uh, they were still making some changes to some of those school schedules. Okay, but I mean, as far as the effectiveness of it, I mean, this has been going on for what, three years? Uh, two years, I think, yeah, or maybe three. Maybe but three. Um, I don't know, Dr. Words, do you have any additional information on that? Can you repeat your question? I just asked if we would be hearing a report on the uh, findings of the TCU study that Dr. Ray is doing on expanding recess time. So we, I've actually met with the professor that was responsible for that. Um, we are continuing at both schools, at Butler and at Ashworth, and um, they will continue into the upper grades. There's been some modifications to the schedules, but they are gonna maintain it at both schools. I actually looked at the data, and there, it, I'd have to go over it with you in detail, but there are some incidents in grade levels where you can tell that the data actually shifted and then other grade levels where it didn't. And the part of the challenge was is it was a study that had a control group and the implementation varied at the two sites. And so there were some data pieces that we had to kind of throw out. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy to sit with you and kind of show you the information that she gave to me about that. Um, we do have it in place for next year at both sites. We don't have any plans right now to expand it because we don't have enough information that we feel would cause us to want to do that. Okay, so there will not be a report to the uh, whole board, but I can come see what you've got. Yeah, I'm happy to share it okay. with you if, you if you want it. Yeah, either way, whichever you prefer. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you both. Um, and I also want to uh, just add that I think uh, the question someone asked was, you know, why have things improved from July, when it, I mean, from earlier when we did it to the July um, survey? And uh, we kind of talked around the edges, but uh, there are two ladies in this room who have had a lot to do with implementing the um, um, steering committee, uh, excuse me, the needs assessment committee on this and uh, running those uh, those programs that we we had all last spring and um, um, uh, the, their influence. Your fingerprints are all over the improvement and thank you all very much and please thank your committee because they have done an outstanding job. 
Absolutely agree. Thank you for all of your hard work. And uh, glad you're both here and not in Disney World. <laughs> Inside joke for those of you wondering. All right, uh, we do have some additional questions. Uh, Mr. Wilbanks. Thank you, Dr. Reich. And uh, thanks again for all the work that went into answering all the questions we had from our last one. We've got a wealth of data to go through here. Um, I'll try to be brief. I know my, some of my colleagues also want to speak, and we want to get out pretty early, given all the work that you've put into this. Um, my first question is on slide, uh, I guess slide six would work, on the amount that we've slotted for elementaries, which includes expanding for um, full day pre-K. Um, is any of that renovation work for any of our K-pods? What are the state of our K-pods? I know they've been described in the past to me as portables with bricks around them. Yes. So. And so um, I think I'm going to ask Mr. Horn to speak to that. But yes, um, we uh, have taken that into account. As in, it's not specifically to uh, pre-K. It's more in general. Uh, I think the uh, uh, the elementary uh, bucket as a whole. So. So, so where we're making additions and so forth for pre-K, the plan would be to, to demolish those structures. In some cases, to make room for the addition, it might include the, the new gymnasium and the, the addition for pre-K or, or K. And in some cases, it may be just because that facility is no longer necessary and we can replace that with, or we're intending to replace that with the classroom addition. Okay, so approximately how many of those K-pods would be taken care of in this room? I need to look at that information a little more closely and get that. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Horn. Um, I guess one of my other questions is on page slide 17. Um, I know we've discussed a little bit about the renovations at Cravens and Wildman Field, but then adding uh, a third, um, making a competitive field at Martin so we can have three fields and split up between the six schools. I would think that taking Martin from where it is now to where it needs to be to have competitions would be a lot more expensive than the upgrades at now, that's a, a good question. We've actually had some discussion about that today because we heard that question uh, from uh, a, a, another direction. Uh, again, I may ask Mr. Horn to come speak to this. I think he can better than I can. It's different work at the existing stadiums and at uh, the, the third field, which we think will be Martin. Um, at, uh, at Martin, there's uh, significantly more concrete involved and uh, parking that we have to add. Uh, but uh, we also, at uh, Cravens and Wildman, we have to demolish some existing facilities. The existing field houses are insufficient and so we'll be demolishing them and rebuilding them. So there are some costs that are similar in terms of restrooms uh, and even field houses, but uh, uh, there's uh, a couple of pieces in particular that, uh, that are different but make the dollars seem a little closer than you would uh, originally perceive. She said it very well. I think the only thing I could add there is that specifically uh, we do have um, a little larger section of bleachers, obviously, to build at Martin or at that third high school field than we would at the other two fields that we currently have. And then, like you said, there's significant parking we would have to add at the Martin location uh, to, to bring it up to code and standard. Can, can I ask a, another clarifying question on that, related to that, Mr. Wilbanks? Yes. Thank you. So, and it's for you, Mr. Horn. So, on the uh, the numbers of uh, seats that will be available for all three uh, facilities, uh, what what is that number? I, I think I've been told, and Mr. White could probably clarify, but you probably know it, uh, that we we need ten to twelve thousand. Is that where we're going to, or what, what or what are we looking at? We currently have, if I remember correctly, roughly eighty four hundred at Cravens and Wildman, and we've looked at a di additional capacity at that third stadium being a little larger. Uh, we haven't settled on an actual number at this point, but uh, we have talked about adding seats that might take us up to close to 10,000 to 10,500 seats. Okay. And that, that is uh, 
a number that's amenable and, and consistent with what the athletic coordinators think they need to, to be competitive in this region. Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. And, and that, third, that third field, we looked at it from the standpoint of uh, that, that field might allow us to have or host those larger uh, events where we might have a, a larger inner city game or, or a game with uh, two, two uh, more, uh, two, two teams that might travel with more folks and that sort of thing. So. Okay, very good. Thank you. And I relinquish back to Mr. Wilbanks. I'll just ask one more question here. Um, and it's relating to the data center. Kudos to you guys for putting together um, the information you provided in our packet about um, the analysis you did at looking at um, going to a host um, uh, public uh, public cloud versus a co-location versus um, our private data center. And it looks like there's a number of cost savings with E-rate and that you guys have made the right decision. Thanks again for putting that together. One, my main question though is what are we doing currently? And so what is that adding to us? So what's the driving need? Would Mr. Dirk Brand answer that? Good evening. So the way we have it currently configured is our secondary data center is actually located in this facility. Mm -hmm. This facility isn't adequate to meet the needs of that. We don't have proper power, proper cooling, right. the proper environment to be able to support that architecture. So we do have we do have a, the bulk of that configured already in a kind of an active active situation from our primary location at the Career Tech Center in the in the in the data center on that site. We simply need to, to find an adequate location to be able to relocate some of the equipment here as well as expand that based upon new services that we've added over the course of, of this bond package. Um, and so the opportunity to have that potentially at the Enterprise Center affords us the opportunity to produce the right environment along with power cooling and to continue that, uh, to upkeep all those services and load balance them between both sites so that our services are always up regardless of, of what that service might be. Okay, so this will be an active, active, it will be active, active. load balance, so we'll be utilizing, it's not just that's right. Or disaster recovery plan. That's right. And one of the advantages of doing that, obviously, it has to be that way in order to get the E-rate funding. So we don't get E-rate funding if something is in a redundant state. So if it's a redundant fiber circuit through a, through a telco or even hardware that we purchase, it has to be in that configuration to get that discount that we receive as a district. So it allows us to balance the load and keep it hopefully as efficient um, and always up for them regardless of, of what service we're running. Okay, great. Thanks, appreciate mm -hmm. it. You bet. That's it for me. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilbanks. Uh, okay, next up is Mr. Chapa. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions about the different projects that, that are in here and some that are that are in and some that came out and that might be something we're looking at putting back in. Um, one that came out was a potential phase two for the Agricultural Science Center. Can somebody explain a little bit more to me like what was that envisioned to be? Okay, so when we uh, designed the plan, the 2014 bond program, uh, that's where we first um, uh, added in, 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 in plan to even build an ag science center at all. As we went through the design process with the architects and we worked uh, with the, uh, uh, the career tech um, administrators and the ag science teachers and even parents and students, uh, envisioning the entire site and the programming there, uh, we actually had identified kind of a phased, a master plan for that site. And so uh, the second phase of that, and Mr. Horn may be able to speak more specifically, was additional uh, pens and additional classrooms even at that site, uh, primarily classrooms, uh, to expand uh, vet tech programming and uh, some other classes uh, to offer at that site. So it would be a, a phase two at the existing facility yes. and not a new facility? Correct. Okay, and, and are we, I assume that's because we're already, I know that was a, a massive expansion over our ag science um, facilities that we had before the 14 bond. So do I take it that even with that expansion, we're full up at capacity and we, we're back to having waiting lists for those programs? We are, yes. In fact, if you go to the facility now, and Ms. Polster or, uh, could speak to it better than I could, but uh, just being there on a daily basis, they, they've got kids waiting to get into those programs. And 
and uh, and quite honestly, just teaching classroom where classes wherever they can. Okay. And I would even start there that some of the kids taking classes there are kids from the schools that do not have uh, the welding labs at their home campus, and they're taking their entry level courses at the Ag Science Center. So uh, addressing those needs at the home campuses as is proposed with this bond program may help that a, a bit. Okay, no, that's yeah. good to know. So is there, what's a, the magnitude of the problem with people waiting to get in? Are we talking about we have a consistent wait list or it's consistent and it's large? That, I would have to get more specific information from, uh, from the career tech folks to okay. answer that question. We can do that. All right, thank you. On, so my next question uh, is... Ms. Mr. Chubbett, can I yeah, ask absolutely. a complimentary question on that? So uh, the, the original, and this probably, well, for either of you, um, the uh, original build, I think, was somewhere around $5 million, maybe 6 It was a little over $6 million, actually. Yeah. And so for this phase two, it's, over, you know, eight, eight four. Um, why is it so? Is it just cost of goods and services uh, time That's change? Be some of it, I think. Yes, yeah. yeah, some, some of it is just that. And then uh, this new facility or addition would be mostly classroom spaces, so the more type expensive of construction first, would be more greater. Very good. Thank you. Relinquish back to Mr. Chopin. Sure. Um, so my next question is on the, this is on the uh, category that I just had a question about. Um, it's under the other section of, a, of the prioritization worksheet that the Capital Needs Steering Committee had. Uh, we've got about 9.5 million for flexible learning space furnishings across all um, ages. What what are we talking about there? Are we talking about tr the, the type of stuff we might see teachers post on GroupMe to buy, you know, chairs that allow students to wiggle around on, or, or is this something different? Well, and I, I think for us to specifically define that. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Uh, we would envision working with a group of principals to determine what that uh, might be at each level. And, uh, and then it, it would be something probably kind of targeted at each school. I mean, certainly not pervasive across every classroom at every campus, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that there would be a, a targeted need identified. And then uh, with the assistance from teachers and with consultants, uh, we would identify what uh, what that means. And I don't know, Mr. Horn, you might have something more specific to add to sure. that. Sure. Well, specifically, we, we looked at the time that we began looking at that we had uh, a number of uh, principals and others who suggested they would like furniture, like we've used at Peach or McNutt or Corey. And mm -hmm. so things, that, different shapes uh, that would allow different configurations and, and students to uh, ex uh, learn uh, without being at the di traditional desk and chair. Okay, and I think it's great that we're going to go out and we're anticipating getting feedback from people and doing something targeted. So, but how did we land on a nine point five million dollar number, given that it's still not really fleshed out? We we looked at uh, a portion of the cost that we spent on those newer facilities across all fifty four elementaries, and then across the the uh, the junior high schools and even the high schools. Okay. So. All right, so my next question is is on the metal gyms. This is another thing that came out that was the, the Capital Needs Steering Committee um, on slide 33 has, has suggested that we try to get back in. So I, I've also heard that we are doing some of the metal gyms. So you can, can you give me a sense of how many metal gyms are there total that we, in an ideal world, would redo all of them? How many are we actually doing, and therefore how many are we leaving out? So we have, and we, we've, I can tell you very specifically on this. We have 12 metal gyms across the district today, okay? okay. Um, by the end of the next five years, um, we will be addressing eight of those in, in various ways. Four of the replacements are embedded within the pre-K uh, renovations, as we talked about earlier. There's one that was identified as what we have, ident have termed a standalone replacement where that campus didn't need any modification uh, for pre-K that would involve the gym, but we identified that uh, gym to be replaced. Two campuses are being rebuilt. So Barry and Thornton each have a metal gym. And so when we rebuild that campus, their metal gyms will be replaced. And one is uh, being replaced as we speak, literally to Jones, where right. we are replacing that. So eight of those 12 um, are, uh, are being addressed in some 
shape, form, or fashion uh, in the next five years. That leaves three then um, uh, to be deferred into the, the potential next bond package. Oh, and one of those, um, uh, there's also a closure. Uh, Roark has a metal gem, so we would be closing uh, that one. So uh, that actually brings us to nine uh, of the 12. Then there are three then left to, um, to consider going forward. Two of those are at campuses that um, we consider at the very top of the list uh, to look at for replacement in the next bond program. Do you know, can you say which ones those are? Oh, I, I can. Uh, it's Blanton and South Davis. That's what I thought. Okay. And so then there's really, there's one other, and it's Duff, and um, uh, that's one that uh, didn't have a, um, any, any other um, need at that campus that uh, ultimately was prioritized uh, is, is something we needed to do now. And so that, that's the, the only other one that uh, is, uh, would be considered potentially in that next bond package. Okay, so on the, the line item for getting the metal gym replacements back in, from what I understand that you just said, is if you take out the, the campuses that we anticipate doing some sort of major renovation or rebuild on, somewhere down the road at Blanton and South Davis, it's really one campus well, there's that has also, a metal gym. Uh, in, in the line item, and Mr. Horn may, may need to help me with this, uh, it wasn't just metal gems that we've looked at. We have other gems, other places that are not metal, but they're undersized. And so as we prioritized, um, I think there were a handful of those that uh, were prioritized out as well. So I don't know if there's... You can provide any yeah, additional so, on that. We'd have to get specifics for you, but yes, there are some in addition to those that that are uh, what we call brick and mortar, but they're smaller, mm -hmm. and, um, just slightly larger than the metal gym itself, and so okay, we will be replaced. So the the eleven point six million dollar figure for the what's categorized as elementary school metal gym replacements is. It, one metal gym and several and other several potentially other, yeah. other sized that gyms. Metal auto. Okay, that but there's no. So there's no. We're not including in this 11.6 estimate any of the campuses that might be down the road the subject of a major. So region. which I want to make sure we're all looking at. The yeah, same. this is on slide 33. Okay. Yeah, I think that that's actually just the gems in general mm -hmm. that we, we chose not to replace. So not just metal, that we probably should drop metal off of that. Okay, that so not including Blanton, not including South Davis, but Duff and the, res the undersized ones. Well, now the South Davis and Blanton ones probably are part of that total, and right. then we took them off in part because we said, okay, oh, okay. probably mm -hmm. going to look at replacing those schools anyway. So adding those <laughs> back would not actually be 11.6, it would be something slightly under that. Probably, okay. yes. Okay. Do we have an idea, and, and I'm sorry if you already answered this, but do we have an idea of how many undersized gyms we would like to replace in an ideal world? I, I can get the number. I don't have that right, right handy. Okay. So. That's fine. Okay, so then... Um, I, I'm sorry. Let me, uh, just to give you another perspective of the gyms in total that are being uh, dealt with, there are a total of 22 gyms that are being replaced or um, addressed in this bond program. Mm -hmm. Some of them are metal, the 12 that we talked about are metal. Right. But there are some others that are undersized, but brick and mortar, uh, that are being addressed again in, in some manner uh, okay. through this bond program. That may help. Yeah, can, can I get some more information on that? Yes. Um, because I think that would help me decide as we look for things whether or not to put back in, you know, what, what maybe there's some wiggle room there or, or not. Um, thank you for that. On the, another thing that was pulled out that the committee has recommended that we look at putting back in, um, and there was quite a bit of support for this at the last meeting for the CNSC that I attended, um, what are we losing by phasing the service center rebuild in two projects versus doing it in one fell swoop? So, um, uh, our, our service center is quite large, um, and um, if you on the north side uh, starts at Arkansas Lane, mm -hmm. uh, and then runs um, south to uh, Colorado Lane, and so uh, 
uh, on the north end, uh, we have uh, the transportation department with the garage and the transportation offices, uh, the covered parking for buses. Uh, as you move back through the service center, then you have the plant services shops for all the trades, the plant services offices, the print shop, uh, the warehouse. And so we're basically looking at, and then there's also uh, the annex buildings that uh, are located up on Arkansas that uh, house security uh, and a couple of other departments at the moment. So we're basically just uh, taking the uh, area furthest north that has the greatest need again, uh, transportation has the greatest need mm -hmm. in terms of replacement and starting there and uh, taking care of that end of the building and this bond program and then the plant services warehouse piece uh, and potentially a next one. And I don't know if you want to add to that. Probably the only thing that we would uh, lose would be the just the fact that we would mobilize twice and so there would be some additional construction costs related to separating the project putting it in two different bond programs. But other than that, we've drawn a line that, that would allow us to, to make modifications to, to the area, like Ms. Powell said, the transportation security department and food service areas that have the greater need for, for additional parking and support for buses and that sort of thing. So we uh, we can make do on the other end uh, yeah. the time if we need to. That's what we're prepared to do. And I know that you're prepared to you know, use the word make do, and we y'all do that a lot, and, so. and we appreciate it. it. But at some level, I, I worry, you know, are we, by doing it that way, are we inhibiting a sort of, at, you know, one solution that creates a lot of efficiencies by doing it all at once? Are we perpetuating some inefficiencies and kicking those off to the next bond package and sort of making a less efficient solution for the sake of just breaking it out and making do? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, obviously we would be doing that. I mean, it, it's obviously efficiency of motion through the site and, and being able to handle uh, traffic and, and, and then just simply moving people around, you know, housing our folks because there's a certain portion of their work that they have to do um, during the day that, that requires them to be on site. The greatest impact probably is our central warehouse and the print shop. Uh, those facilities are, are undersized. Um, for, for my area of maintenance and operations, most of our folks are remote. They're, they're in their vehicles or they're on campuses. So uh, the impact to us is the beginning of the day and the end of the day. But our, our central warehouse is, is small for a district this size. And our print shop is obviously uh, also small for a district. And so those would be in this first phase? They, the print shop and central warehouse would be in the second phase. So even though they're the greatest need, we're willing to kick the can to phase two. I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not <laughs> flipping about it. I'm just no. I, I, we just we just felt like it was an opportunity to to uh, to reduce some some cost and and apply that back towards the, what we think would be the greater need, which would be the students. So okay, no, that that's that's good to know because I know that there were a few people um, on the capital needs steering committee who had some familiarity with mm -hmm. that service center and different aspects of it, and they were they were quite adamant as well as other. Um, staff members who have occasion to go over there that that things are actually in, in fact quite dire yeah, um, it, and so i just want to make sure that we don't it's one of our oldest facilities and yeah. it's been around for a long long time but um, but again most of most of our work as long as we can keep a, a roof over the top and keep it dry we uh, we we can keep it safe from a perimeter standpoint and, and again we've just tried to prioritize sure. and make sure the needs were yeah well what well, we can hopefully we can do better than right. that okay um the, another question, um, I'm switching now to the CTC edition. This is one um, that had some, some traction with the committee that was ultimately, it, it looks like, not um, something that got votes to, to be a high priority re -add, but a nice thing we could do if we did it. And I know we've had such success with the CTC and it's already at capacity in its second year. Um, my question though is, is tonight, the, the 9.9 .9 million expansion, if it were to be added back to the package, was linked to a, a potential health, ser health sciences program. And I don't really remember that being, those two things being linked um, in prior discussions. And so, you know, my, I guess my question is, is, is what was the, you know, what were we planning on doing with that original 9.9 .9 million estimate if, it, if the, the health sciences program is something that has been a more recent discussion? Right, and so um, I, I will also let uh, Mr. Horn address the, the specifically what those spaces are. Um, I, I will say that uh, when the committee uh, looked at these items that had been pulled out and began to kind of uh, share their thoughts about uh, priorities within mm -hmm. these items, uh, at that point, we 
we're not specifically visiting with them about the possibility of uh, using that space to also uh, help us uh, implement uh, a health sciences program. Uh, but there are 10 classrooms, three labs initially, but I think as we've talked about even recently, uh, the greater thing more than just the quantity of those rooms I just read off is the total square footage mm -hmm. okay. and the type of space that was used as we priced it out. And so I think um, we feel like that uh, we've got uh, dollars there uh, to allow us some flexibility in configuring the specific spaces, whether it be take maybe um, uh, one or two or more of those classrooms and use them instead for labs. So I don't know if you want to address that. No, I think you did a good job. I think we, we've looked at it from the standpoint of adding just uh, upwards of 25,000 square feet to the facility. Uh, and we, had, like Ms. Powell said, initially we looked at approximately 10 classrooms and multiple labs. Um, but it, I think the, the programming needs have changed a bit over the course of this past year. And mm -hmm. I think we, we heard uh, just the numbers of of upwards of 6,400 students being served next year, so, wow. which is significantly greater than yeah. the 4,700 that we were at when we first opened. Yeah, So no, it's, it's been a great success. Mm -hmm. So it, sort of linked into that, um, you know, another part of the package that it, that is in is that we're going to build out spaces at each of the high schools for the introductory welding programs and some of the other programs that are at the CTC. So my concern is, and, and maybe this is partially addressed by if we were able to get the CTC addition in, is are we creating, we know demand is high, are we creating even more demand by building out these introductory spaces at the home campuses? Um, are we creating more demand that needs to ultimately be met their junior, senior years at the CTC? And if so, would this addition accomplish that or do we actually need more than that? I think I think uh, I can partially answer that is that yes, you know, as we provide more spaces and we see that uh, in our programs grow and and programs become successful, success, success begets success. Um, and um, some of those kids right now in those entry level courses, we are making do uh, use that term again uh, by serving them at uh, the Ag Science Center, but mm -hmm. we're still limited on the number right. of kids we can serve there. Right. And so I, I think to your point, yes, um, if we are right sizing those spaces on the home campuses, uh, we will expect to see those programs go, and those are the feeders into uh, the, the Career Tech Center. Uh, so, so do our existing CTC spaces for those programs, would they be able to accommodate that increase in demand, or would we need an addition that is, in fact, not the addition that we're proposing? Would we need something else? I, when we worked with the Career Tech uh, folks, we talked to them specifically about programs, not about just, you know, if you could have more space, how many more spaces would you want? And they looked specifically at their current enrollments in these different programs, and they used those enrollments and their anticipation of program growth to, if you will, build a schedule uh, and then back into, okay, we need this many classrooms and these types of spaces uh, to accommodate the schedules. Um, you know, I think is if this is something that uh, we want to go forward with, we'll just have to have some additional conversation around uh, the programming itself if now we're introducing, and some of this was around health sciences, mm -hmm. uh, but we just have to have a very specific look at what that program would look like and what space it might yield. We feel pretty comfortable with the dollars that are there right now right. Um, to, to allow us to do that. Um, so just to, go ahead. If I could add just, um, so this is where it becomes an interdependent puzzle really with Career Tech is a good example of that because part of their um, processing in this was let's not be so absolute about the type of space. Mm -hmm. Let's just make sure we have enough square footage. Uh, so that they can ebb and flow some of those programs and they're not locked into a certain type of space. That's one. The other is if we can build the capacity of the existing high schools for introductory programs, then that helps. I do think that there's still some, and there will be, I think, in the future, some expansion possibility even within the schedule and the time. As Ms. Powell said earlier, they're going for welding from 6.30 a.m. and all that. Uh, but functionally to be able to accomplish a lot of these things, including the capacity, uh, this, is, this is one of the ways to do it and to have a specialized program for health sciences, understanding that some of the space will also be for the health sciences that currently exist, not in that specialized program. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
a lot of that is also a lot of value for the investment that I think is another way of looking at that at that um, uh, kind of investment on on the facility itself. But I think as from discussions with the Curtex uh, staff is the ability to program that space in a way that we're not saying, okay, this will all be a health science space, right. but rather it will allow the flow to offer a health science program in a specialized way. Okay, I mean, that's all good to know, because my, my concern is, is that if we're gonna build out the introductory programs and we're gonna increase demand, then I wanna make sure that we can accommodate that by the time those students get to the CTC and not have, which is a great, great problem to have, but the problem that it seems we're already having with the Ag Science Center and already having with some CTC programs is we're a little bit a victim of our own success, and so there's this build-up period where we do an expansion, but it's not enough to meet the demand, and so then we continue to have wait lists, and there's some kids who unfortunately can't take part in the programs. If we see that, if we see that on the front end, if we're looking at a billion dollar bond and we need, you know, if what we really need at the CTC, which is a great problem to have again, is a $15 million addition and that would accommodate all that rather than a 9.9, .9, then, then you know, I, I, I just want to know that because I would rather, speaking for myself, want to address this now because in the grand scheme of things, it's not very much and it makes sure that we don't, we're not in the position five, six, seven years down the road where we're coming back and we're like, we have these big waiting lists for these programs mm -hmm. and, and we need to do another addition. Um, and that, that's my that's my concern with that. Um, another question, switching gears totally. Um, the junior high athletic additions that are on the sheets, um, this is about 7.1 million. In, in the last bond we had, um, we have new foot, turfed football fields at all of the junior high campuses and tracks at all of them too, except Carter because of the site issues with Johnson Creek. Um, what What are these junior high addition athletic additions that that we're looking at and you know what what do we get from them right that is the value add that we didn't get from what we did in the last one right and so um, for starters with the 2014 bond program um, we we turfed the Carter field and then through the partnership with the the uh, with Gene and Jerry Jones Foundation, we we turfed uh, the Workman Field. The rest of them are still grass okay. fields, and we had to relocate all of them as part of the work we did. Um, I'm going to let Mr. Horn speak to the, to what's here. It's consistent across all the campuses in terms of concessions, uh, and um, uh, then uh, ticket booths and uh, restrooms and lighting. So I think I sure. catch them all. Yeah, I think so. So the uh, I'll take you back just a bit to when we started that. We, we, we took a step backwards to make sure that we master plan the junior high school fields entirely so that we could accommodate uh, future needs like lighting and, and maybe a widening of the track to an eight lane track and that sort of thing. So um, so each, each of those junior high school fields except uh, Carter, which is a bit different without a track, and Workman, which has the artificial turf field that was donated to us, all of them are, are equal uh, in, in what they have today. They all have uh, four lane tracks. They all have uh, bleachers that are either new or that were, were relatively new when we started that have been made ADA compliant, have accessible routes to each and every one of those. And so we've set ourselves up to, in this bond program potentially to add uh, concession, ticket, restroom, and storage needs at each of those schools. Um, probably the most important to the campus, obviously, is the restroom so that they don't have to, our patrons don't have to walk so far back to the campus and we don't have to leave the campus open and make it vulnerable to, to others who might not be um, people that we intend to have there. And then additionally, if, if all things are, are approved and, and the city would approve us doing so, we would potentially add lighting, new LED lighting to the fields, which would improve our use of that field uh, for the students, uh, at, you know, after hours. So it's primarily lighting, and then the uh, the combination of storage, ticketing, uh, restrooms, and uh, and concessions buildings. Okay, all right. Thank you. That, that's pretty much all the questions I have. Um, you know, we, we're on a fairly tight timeline. It looks like we've got to get this if we're going to do something with it. We got to vote on it by August 19th. So. You know, not a lot of time. There's a lot of stuff to look at. Thank you all for working over the summer and getting all of this put together. And we've got a lot of tough decisions to make. I, I think I've kind of signaled, you know, where I am, where I, you know, this addresses a lot of stuff that's been, you know, percolating for a long time. And I'd like to, especially given the strong support 
um, all the hard work that's gone in, into it to this point to educate the public about the needs that we have, I'd really like to get what we can in here and, and, and get some things moved down the road instead of deferring. Um, you know, sometimes we got to do that, but if this is not a situation or there's a real need, uh, you know, I don't want to defer those, don't defer those unnecessarily. Um, I think this is going to continue the, the great work that started in 2014. I, I really would like to get, you know, some of these things that the committee has recommended that we, we reconsider putting back in, back in. Um, but I look forward to discussing that with my colleagues next week. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chapa. Um, uh, Mr. Horn or Ms. Powell, uh, just a related question on the, the lighting for the junior highs. Um, the, I thought the reason originally that was what we had in the 2014 bond, but then we had a switch and gave tracks instead because of city and, and concerns. So do, th that's the same thing that's back in here, or am I misunderstanding? Well, so the, the 2014 bond did uh, include funds for the tracks, the four lane tracks to begin with. Um, we had anticipated new lighting at all of them right after we passed the bond package. Uh, uh, the Unified Development Code changed, and so uh, that uh, uh, limited us, and we weren't able to put the lighting in. Like Mr. Horn said, uh, we really had a need anyway uh, to, to, to make sure that we master planned each site. Uh, and so we took this opportunity. So instead of doing lights, which we weren't able to do under the UDC at that point, uh, to master plan and, and set us up going down the road to be able to, to handle uh, expanding the track and lights and better bleachers and what have you. Uh, we had, we're having some conversation with the city. The city has made some tweaks even on their own end uh, in terms of what they can do in parks uh, with lighting recently. And so that's a conversation that uh, we, we will continue and uh, maybe uh, formalize it a bit more with them uh, so that uh, that uh, does become something that we can take advantage of. Okay, okay. So with the, uh, the UDC as well as the continued discussions, it's looking much more favorable mm -hmm. to actually occur. Much, uh, you know, it's Because more last favorable. time there were yeah. so many people so excited, finally we're gonna be able to see our kids playing football. It's, it's favorable. And it, I mean, we had much a unique... may, you know, I don't know that I can say that yet, but yes. <laughs> if you had a crystal ball, or could you guarantee? Well, that's that's Mr. Right. Turco. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you. Uh, we still have uh, some other trustees, Ms. Walton. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Um, back to slide uh, 11 and probably uh, Mr. Horn. Um, with uh, a thought occurred to me after when we were talking about the print shop, <clears throat> with computers and electronic communications and all that, are we are we printing as much as we used to, oh, or more? I've, or more? I have to leave that uh, to somebody why don't we else. Let uh, Mr. Branham answer that question. And while he's coming down, uh, Mr. Horn says that uh, he has confirmed that uh, uh, the plans for the, the new stadium are 10,000 seats, okay? Oh, for the new field. I, I've the, got to switch gears. So I'll, okay, I'll the one new field would be 10,000, okay. Yes. <laughs> <coughs> yes, regarding the print shop, we've actually increased the volume quite a bit. We do a ton for all of the campuses. They submit online, re online requests for whether it's graduation announcements or just ongoing um, items for um, clubs, programs, district-wide type of things. Any Anything that might be of a high volume, we actually route over to the print shop because it's cheaper per page to do it through their process than it is on the local campus. Common yep, common assessment, state assessment, any, or local assessments throughout the district, all those things go through the print shop. So that does lead to quite, quite the volume for sure. Okay, so it's about where it always has been? As yes. Far as volume. Okay. I, I would say it's, it's grown. It, it's probably it's continuing to grow just because of the dependency we have on uh, local assessments. We've increased those across the system as well as some it. of I the things that campuses want to do. We route directly to there just because it's more cost effective to do so. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, and um, doing the two phases. Uh, what happens? Um, we'll be tearing stuff down, and programs that are housed there will. You know, what, what will happen to, like, um, the student records, the, the photography studio, library services? We're, we're actually working with, hmm? we're actually working with those, each of those departments to determine uh, where we might relocate those facilities, different facilities, try to be, begin to combine 
just like we've talked about with the Enterprise Center. We would also look at those those folks that are in uh, the annexes one, two, and three, mm -hmm. try to find common places where uh, they can operate uh, in current district facilities that would be more up to a standard, um, a greater standard than, than what we have with those annexes currently. So in other words, most those annexes are just, oh. just metal buildings, obviously you've seen them, and we don't, they're not, they don't be code in a lot of ways where relative to restroom, restrooms and lighting and so forth. Just uh, the ability to have people that and... might be disabled uh, walk up and down the corridor. So um, we don't have elevators in Annex mm -hmm. 1, for example. So those facilities have served their purpose for quite some time. But oh, I, um, I agree. I, I'm just, I mean, will they be relocated temporarily or will they find a permanent homes? Te temporarily, yes, but we would find permanent homes uh, through all of these these various moves and and, uh, and and the reconstruction that we plan. So many of us, like the admin building folks, um, even, even us in maintenance, if we were to do um, a complete renovation of that site, we would still. We would also have to to phase all of this construction so that we could use swing spaces such as the old Turning Point High School to move temporarily to, while we were being relocated to a new facility that was being constructed, or a one that was that would would ultimately have space such as Turning Point. Turning Point might become a house for, uh, for some of these programs permanently when we finish all of this. And uh, if I could add. Uh, um, Part of the work, uh, one of the recommendations is uh, some renovations at the Enterprise Center. So it's it's kind of moving some people around, uh, again, to ultimately gain efficiencies. So uh, to Mr. Horn's point, uh, swing space temporarily even, we might uh, move uh, some folks out of those annex buildings to what was the old Turning Point High School. Uh, and then ultimately, as we bring online, uh, the Enterprise Center where we're finishing out uh, a floor that today is vacant and begin moving people, more of the uh, instructional folks there, maybe even out of Annex 4, uh, then that frees up some office space there. So we just kind of keep moving folks around <laughs> and, and ultimately build those efficiencies and, and try to ultimately close some of those facilities that are uh, no longer functional or, or efficient for us in the rebuild of transportation and security, a, a, a large number of the folks that occupy uh, the Annex 1 building, that is security. So they will wind up with new office space there. So um, Mr. Horn, I think, said it well that, uh, you know, we'll move folks around and ultimately uh, gain efficiencies uh, over the term of five years by moving uh, more people into um, uh, fewer spaces, mm -hmm. and more efficient spaces. Well, and, and some of those programs aren't maintenance at all. You know, right. if this the is annex, a maintenance facility, yeah, right. the you know, it, buildings, they are not. You're yeah. correct. So, um, you know, they may be more suited for enterprise mm -hmm. or someplace, but a permanent home that fits their needs will be found. I assume is what you're saying. Yes, Thank better, you. Better home. <laughs> Good answer. All right. Thank you, Miss Walton. Mr. Hogg. Thank you, Dr. Ryson. It'll be quick. Um, Mr. Chopper, I appreciate your questions. They were good thought process, and I agree with you on that, of adding and making sure we're adding those things. And Ms. Ms. Powell, as we look to add possibly those things, I, I would be sit there and say, I'm not looking to add unless I can pull something else out. Um, I think the easiest piece to think about, and let me ask the question, is we talk about um, priority condition needs. Um, Mr. Horn, you list these, and I know we list them as averages. We expect an H field turf to go eight to 10 years. We expect uh, an air conditioner and a roof to go, whatever it is, 15, 20 years, um, however long. And, and we're basing those on averages, correct? We're not replacing them just because they're on a schedule. We're waiting till they're at, the repair cost is more than what it's right. helping us. Like, like what you do in your home. I hate to use that as a comparison, but like you do in your home, I hope my air conditioner, I can keep mine going a lot longer because I don't want to spend that money. Um, so we're taking those on those conditions, correct? So if we add those things, is there a way to stretch? And I just, I don't need an answer, but start thinking of, can we stretch those priority conditions out um, longer to- And I'll address it and have Mr. Horner. I, we have been stretching, and I, I think that's why we have a lot of need at the moment. Uh, as we put the bond, uh, did our assessment, um, 
Uh, we had a very comprehensive list totaling $1.2 billion initially of identified needs. And then as we had to begin to prioritize, um, we worked with our architect firms, uh, Corgan uh, for elementaries and administrative offices, and then Stantec for secondary schools and athletic facilities. And we, we put each, you've, you've heard us talk about this before, each uh, building, each campus, uh, went into a priority tier from one to five. Five being our newest schools right. with the least needs and one with the schools that had the greatest needs. And so we had to look at those buildings kind of holistically instead of um, just picking one particular element and saying, well, um, you know, let's pick this, this item out and leave it aside, but do everything else at the building. Because when you mobilize for construction, there are general conditions together, and course. what have you that, that you're gonna pay every time you mobilize. And so we had to be mindful of that. And so we tried to look at it uh, first from the specific uh, uh, system itself and its condition, and then also holistically. And so what you'll find, and you kind of saw it on the chart, uh, uh, that showed uh, the percent of the dollars uh, to the total and how that tracked across networks. The networks that have the older buildings, you see more dollars there uh, and also more square footage. Uh, but um, because we're trying to address a building as, as a whole as best we can. Uh, so I don't know if you want to add no, to I, that. I think your assessment was, was spot on and, and Ms. Powell's correct. What we've done already is we've, we've stripped down, so to speak, those facilities that we know um, that are, are newer, uh, and you could take the 13 prototype elementaries that we have, the Bergen, mm -hmm. Hales, those types. We we have we've kept dollars that are important to those campuses, but but we've done exactly what you said. We've begun to look at that and say, you know, let's just stretch that a little further to the next bond, and let's focus our dollars on the 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 Mary Moores and the Fitzgeralds and and the Mortons, those schools that are older, where we can't go any further. And in, and in this district, we've done a very good job over the years of stretching and, you know, without big bond programs, we've gone as far as we can. But um, but if we're not careful, those large systems, those chiller systems that we have in all those schools, uh, they hit us in between bond programs and, and they have to come out of M&O funds at that point. And it could get quite expensive when you're replacing $300,000, $400,000 chillers out of maintenance dollars. Yep. So... So we, we've done exactly what you, you said. We've looked at everything from an average standpoint. And, and in this district, we've done a very good job over the years of, of stretching things. But we've reached kind of a critical point where we need to really focus hard on those on those schools that are in that 30 to 40 year old range that need uh, a lot of attention. I understand that. And I just would ask my colleagues start. So start thinking about that as we look at if you want to add something, where is it coming or how is it going? So I think that's something we have to think about. Um, from this process, where where is it? Because um, there's a lot of things that are needs um, that we determine. Um, you know, I would put every penny we have into career tech any way possible from seeing what it's done. But uh, I think we also have to think where where's the limit? Where do we draw those? And so just as we go into this next week or so, a couple weeks to make that decision, we've got to think about those things. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Hogg. I don't see any other lights. I do have a couple of comments and questions uh, myself, and maybe that'll spur some others. <laughs> Seems to always, right? Um, Mr. Tapa did a very good job of going through the things that are in and out uh, on that slide 33 on page 17 on our handout. Uh, one of the things that we didn't talk about was, though, the uh, uh, softball field renovations, and I just wanted to discuss that just briefly. Um, so, and, and I had asked earlier about, you know, is there a possibility of sharing, sharing that with baseball and have shared use? And the, the, the response provided was uh, centered around a, a, a few different elements. One was uh, there's a slight overlap, which Honestly, I think that's probably minor. I, I, that's something that we scheduling complexities are we've handled much greater than that. I think in athletics, but there was also physical things on the the uh, the field uh, infield uh, mm -hmm. turf for baseball versus dirt for softball, mm -hmm. uh, flat mound for softball versus raised mound pitcher's mound uh, for uh, baseball. Um, had there been any thought? Uh, 
as far as a, an analysis or comparison, and, and I, maybe this is just ridiculous to even consider, but uh, still looking at a possibility of shared use to take uh, the, uh, the baseball fields and use a turf that you can switch out so that it's a dirt field for the softball, kind of like what AT&T does, you know, with taking their turf out and all. Of course, they're AT&T and we're AI is a little bit different, but uh, uh, yeah, cost-wise, is that is that just ridiculous to look at that? I'm just looking at the, whatever it is, the $6.9, $7 million. Uh, we, we, we didn't look at the, at the, or consider shared use for baseball, softball. Uh, for the reasons, some of the reasons you mentioned and some others, base path distances and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and then practice, the use of the facility for practice. I'd probably uh, be better to let Coach White talk a little bit more to the number of fields he's seen in that situation. That you could, I know you can do it if you have an artificial turf field and you have an artificial mound that's put in place, but, right. uh, but then you have to have different markings for, for base right. path, different distances and that sort of thing. But we sure. want, coach, would you like but to? Then you have the ongoing operating costs. Right, to, right. to, to do that. To, it would right. just be a, another. Yeah, thing. yeah. I mean, logistically, maybe it is a nightmare. <laughs> I, I was, I was just curious, and and I do think it's uh, th that is something not necessarily shared use, but if a shared use is an impossibility, that this is one of those items that seems to be I've not kind of worthy it. to consider for I this group. I don't know that I've seen it anywhere at at, a, at any uh, high school settings. I've seen it in in public parks and recreation facilities, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the shared use that you see probably um, the, the only time I've seen a shared use that crosses those lines is with younger kids. You'll see a little league field that is because of their base path stays the same. They'll they'll use a sixty foot path, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and so you can play little league and then bring in adult league softball. And so they can cross use those, but at, at a high school level in that age group, the differences in the field from fence, uh, the fence, the outfield right. fences, right, right. width, uh, the depth, all that that goes with that. I, I have not seen it at a high school level where you could cross that over. Okay. Uh, I think it would probably, even if we looked at that space, your, your cost probably would increase beyond what we're doing with, with renovation. Gotcha. And then you do worry about uh, just the number of having yep. three, three baseball teams, three softball teams, and the, the practicing piece and all right. that other. So right. I think it would be difficult. It's, when you said it, I kind of started to think through it. But the only places I've really seen that is at the younger groups. You'll see the gotcha. big league dreams where they'll come out and they'll right. play softball and baseball, but it's a diff it's difference in age groups. Right. Very good. Very good. Well, I think it's, again, worthy for us to, to – consider that as an addition back in. I figured it would probably be some, something out there. That's why I opened it with maybe this is ridiculous. So just a couple of clarifying questions. Can I ask a follow-up question to the baseball softball thing, please? Sure. Um, how, many, how many... Oh, there you go. sorry. Um, how many students are involved uh, in softball and in the baseball? I, I'm not familiar with athletics at all. On a, we have a uh, majority of our schools will carry three baseball teams and three softball teams. A softball team is generally 15 to 18 kids <coughs> uh, per team. So you're looking, depending on the, you, and depending, some schools could carry a, a, an extra ninth grade team, but in a baseball team is in the same range at 18 to 20 kids. So probably um, 45 to 50 softball players per high school campus is probably a pretty close number. It may get up to 60 in some, mm -hmm. and baseball is probably in that same range around 60 uh, kids per, per program. So 120 per school would probably be a pretty safe number. So you're looking at quick quick math there, 750 kids around that around that area. Thank you very much. Thank All you, right. Dr. And maybe Raj. don't go too far. Oh, you're you're welcome, Miss Walton. Uh, Mr. Choppa had a related uh, softball question. Go ahead, Mr. Choppa. It was a sort of a comment and a question. My first comment was, is, is, is we discussed at the last meeting in June, or as I mentioned, you know, the, I, the last Capital Needs Steering Committee, I, I, I think, I, and I don't want to overstep my bounds here because we've got our co-chairs here, but the, the softball fields, getting those back in, overwhelmingly had the support of that committee, and I think that yeah. it was unanimous that they wanted those back in and, and, and thought they should be in. Um, and I think it's a drop in the bucket compared to what we're looking at. We should absolutely do it. Um, on 
Dr. Reich's point, though, of looking at ways that we could maybe find some synergies and find some efficiencies where we're not duplicating efforts. I, I know that the layouts between where some of the baseball and softball fields are, are different on each campus, but maybe something we could explore because one of the things on here identified as the soft, you know, the softball fields is we would require um, looking at concession stands at, at the fields at the campuses where the fields are in close lo location. Maybe they could share concession facilities, and that might be a way to shave a little bit, get a little bit of efficiency and savings there. Uh, and and to your point, that's a great, uh, that's a perfect idea, and we we looked at that where we might have uh, two fields that say, I, in my mind, I see Seguin. Uh, and Sam's right next door too. Exactly. Yeah. And so in some of those cases where we have those two fields together, or we've proposed putting them together, we've proposed, Coach and I have talked about a common concession restroom uh, storage type facility there uh, so that we can serve the needs of both. Uh, right. where, where at Sam, for example, it needs improvement on, on both aspects. We just put it together. And so some of those dollars that are listed there would serve baseball also. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Very good. Um, so uh, some additional clarifications and questions. And uh, on the uh, full day pre-K, what I, I haven't heard, and I guess it, it's, it's not something that is uh, moving forward, would be standalone pre-K centers. Is that correct? Right. Um, you know, that was something we looked at early on, and we've ultimately determined that we have um, we, we have such sufficient capacity at um, our existing schools that it really didn't seem an efficient use of dollars uh, to build yet another building to serve kids when we can serve them on their home campuses. Okay. And then uh, was there... And, and I'm not a, a averse to that whatsoever. It, was there thoughts or consideration given from the, the, the children's perspective, the learner's perspective, as pre-Ks going to an elementary campus uh, versus maybe what would be a standalone center? Just, just curious. I don't. I'm not asking for that. But the the, the work that we did uh, in that regard was not so much about going to a separate campus, but around the classroom and uh, the furnishings in those mm -hmm. rooms. We actually had a focus group uh, that, uh, that Mr. Sturtz uh, facilitated for us May a year ago uh, where we brought in um, pre-K teachers, uh, a couple of principals, uh, some of the, the instructional folks, and talked to them about um, what that pre-K environment needed to look like for them, what kind of furnishings that they needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and the, they talked about lighting and PlayStations and different things uh, within the room. So we, we have that perspective more specific to the classroom than to a separate building. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Um, one comment I have on, on the, the, the package as presented and the other considerations, what I, I, I just hats off to everybody, um, the... The, the focus on the student is, it, it resonates throughout. And what is really uh, something that I think is important to all of us here is the focus on equity for all students, not just equal, but equity. And um, I, I have starred the, uh, the uh, calculator program as an example. That isn't something that's been around. And that puts a significant disadvantage on some students versus others. So that's just one more example. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful, the things that are going on. So thank you for including that uh, uh, as a focal point all the time. Um, so I don't have any other, other questions myself personally except to this body, which is we are on a short timeline. Uh, I think I know what the answer is, but just a general nod uh, from the group. Are you uh, wanting to digest this and, and come back with your firm thoughts on let's include this, let's exclude that, or do you want to try to discuss any of that here this evening? I got not tonight, not tonight, not tonight. I see mostly not tonight. I've got two. Sorry, go go ahead, President Mays. I'm sorry. It's certainly your call. It's your. Yeah, I was going to say probably at least um, some of the things that 
if there's a, a consensus, because we are time crunch and there's so mm -hmm. much to think about, at least get those out the way so we're not individually thinking about it for two weeks and it's something that we already could have been in a consensus for. That's just my thought. Okay. All right. Um, and I, I guess I would caution the, the board on uh, exactly what Ms. Mrs. Mays just mentioned, if there is consensus. So let's try to just be cognizant of that. So if right out of the gate there's not consensus, let's just leave it in the parking lot and move on to the next item so that we can get through these pretty quickly to see if there is that consensus. Mr. Chapa, go ahead. Sure. I, 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 I I had asked for some more data on some of these, and so I, I would like to wait for those that data unless some other board members bring up that they are strongly in favor of, for example, the, the elementary school gymnasiums. If there's cons strong consensus on that tonight that we want it back in, I'm happy to go along with that, but I think I'd like to see more data to know what's in and out of that. And the same with um, you know, um, the CTC edition and seeing what, what potentially that still needs to look like. Although I, I do feel like there's probably consensus on the CTC edition given the, the synergies that we've had there and the great success. But I think, um, you know, based on the discussions I saw with the Capital Needs Steering Committee and the discussions we had at our last meeting in June, um, I would like to get consensus on putting the softball field renovations um, back into this package. I think it's a relatively small amount, especially compared to what we're, we're looking at. I think that this is something that the softball community very strongly supports that we've Several of us have heard from members of that community. Um, I know that's something the Capital Needs Steering Committee wanted in, and um, I just would like that to, to be in a, a lock in that assumption going forward. All right. So with that said, uh, just to, let's do just a nod. We're not, not voting. This is just direction to, at this point, uh, to give staff um, softball fields. You're, you're okay? Yes, I got the Mr. Hogg. Go right ahead. I think softball is a critical one. I think that's important on there. Um, I'm not comfortable saying I'm okay adding it in until I'm able to pick a part and possibly find something that I want to pull out. Um, just plain and simple. I, I'm, I'm not going to sit there and say I'm automatically okay with adding something in. I think that's a good one to add in. Probably if I had to put on the list of where they come, I think that's a strong one. But, um, you know, seeing some of these stats and data we got back without a lot of time to even dig deeper, I'm not going to just say yes, we're okay. adding it back in. So do we want to say yes on a conditional and we look at all the pieces together next week? That's that's fine. I would be okay with that for next Thursday. Um, but I'm not going to say yes automatically. Okay. All right. Um, Is it related to Mr. Hogg's comment? Or? Yes. Okay, go okay. ahead. Um, I've, heard no, I've heard numbers of the total package uh, as it stands now, and I have, you know, what the cost of, of, of the deferred items. Mm -hmm. And there was also something mentioned about our, bo our bond indebtedness, our tax rate would not go up at a certain point. Could I have all three of those numbers again? So uh, the current package is $965,930,945. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the items, get to the page that... Uh, yeah, I, I've, got, uh, I've got those on page uh, 17. Yeah, okay, uh, but the... See, is that what the... What was the number that our, our uh, tax in, would not... So what we've modeled is uh, we could do one billion and not uh, increase the tax rate. Thank you. Those were the numbers I needed. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Chapa. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify um, just sort of where I stand on a few things and, and, and provide a little bit more information. On the, on the softball fields, one reason I feel so comfortable pushing for it tonight is is I feel like, but for sort of just a quirk in how the voting happened at the last Capital Needs Steering Committee, that the committee was pretty adamant that that, would, that should have been part of the package and not should have, shouldn't have come out at 965. It should have come out at 965 plus the softball fields. 
So that, that's why I feel comfortable pushing for it tonight. But I, I, as, a, as a more um, philosophical matter, I, I, I don't, and I certainly appreciate Mr. Hogg's concern with, you know, where do we draw the line? We're already at a big number and, and, and things of that nature. But I also want to, to caution us about getting into a position where we have a discussion going forward where when we look at things we want to put in that we feel like there's a good reason to put in, you know, for whatever reasons individual board members might have for those, that it's on the assumption that it's a tit for tat and we're going to have to pull something out to get something back in because I don't, one, I think in the scenario that we're in, I think if this were, if we were in a scenario where we were looking at a significantly smaller bond package um, or we had significantly fewer resources or we were looking at a situation where um, a bond package would would increase the effective ta or would increase um, the, the the tax rate, then I think that that, that all, all those things are different. But I think from the information that we have in front of us, um, where we could increase the amount of this bond package, because let's be honest, and I said this last meeting, they're between a nine hundred sixty five million dollar bond package and a nine hundred ninety million dollar bond package. And, you know, at some point we're splitting hairs, especially when there won't be a tax rate increase. And then we learned tonight that there's almost 70% support. And for some of these, over 80% support for some components of this bond package. And in no scenario um, that we looked at tonight are any of these particular items, on, you know, don't enjoy almost supermajority support. I think that I, I don't want to be in a situation where we're in a, in a prolonged tit for tat argument about what comes out, what comes in, when at the end of the day there's no increase in the tax rate. And, um, and there's great support for this, and we've done a great job educating the community on it. So I just wanted to, to sort of set that as where my position is, is that's not an expectation that I have. Okay. Very good, Mr. Wilbanks. Well, I appreciate the comments from uh, Mr. Choppa, and I agree with him that I came in here tonight knowing that I wanted to do what I could to get the softballs back in. It's a matter of equity, it needs to be there. Um, likewise, with the CTC edition, um, again, Mr. Chapa had a great line of questioning and looking at down the road what the, and um, uncovering some options in terms of the wisest path forward and so that we can continue to meet the needs of those students. Um, but I agree with Mr. Hogg in that, you know, this is a big number. and. We have a whole host of constituents that we need to consider in this decision. And if there is a way to save money and back off away from that billion dollar perception, because what, we're, what we've done in the past is we started 194 million with the 2009 bond, then um, 663, and then now a billion. I think our constituents might get concerned that we're growing exponentially, exponentially, excuse me, it's late, my voice is going. Um, and we need to do what we can to, to kind of cap that perception that um, our costs in terms of capital needs are growing that fast. And I think there's some ways, I think we still have time to look creatively and look and see if some of those maintenance issues um, can be deferred. I mean, um, $443 million of maintenance and conditioning projects, that's a lot of projects. And so I would have questions on, you know, is it feasible for us to take on that amount of projects over five years, or if that's realistically more doable in six years? And if we do that, we free up enough money to put those things that we know our parents and our students are demanding, like the CDC Center, and the softball, and maybe even freeing up enough money to, um, what was the term used for our maintenance facilities? It was, it was uh, in critical need of being a what, dire. dire need of being addressed. So those three things, I want to really dive down into the numbers and see where can we um, help change the perception that we're just growing exponentially in our, our um, capital needs um, and still a focus on what's more important, that's those students out there. Um, and I think we can do that. I think um, I've been playing around with some numbers and I would just encourage us to, to 
think holistically about this in terms of all our constituents and down the road. Another thing that I'm concerned with is, um, you know, fortunately with HB3, there's no longer a need for us to do a TRE. But how many of us um, trust the legislature going forward? And even with the current funding, um, our need to go out for a TRE in the future could be within this five-year bond package. Um, we've gotten reprieve now, so we still want to be able to do that and to our constituents and do it in a way that's um, financially responsible and hopefully if we ever do need to do a TRE, we'd be able to do it where we could do a swap and without raising rates. So those are some of my long-term concerns. And so if we can cut and bring back the programs we think are more important, which unfortunately means maybe some more deferred maintenance. But I think we can do that realistically. We don't say we're gonna defer it for another 10 years. We look and maybe look at things that we can take um, a portion of that package and move it into year six. So those are the things, I, you know, I'm open to suggestions, but I think we need to dive deep into the numbers over the next week and come back and look um, and, and focus on what's more important. As Dr. Reich said, it's those students, so. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Wilbanks. And it, it seems that, I, that the, the topics that we've addressed were potentially, I guess you could say, um, the, the lower hanging fruit and we're having this kind of discussion even with those that we we don't necessarily 100% support. Uh, there maybe is some opposition or some additional consideration. So it would seem to me that we do need to di uh, digest this a, a little bit more. Uh, so I, I don't think I'm gonna continue on that conversation uh, path, uh, but I do want to uh, acknowledge that we do have a couple others here. So uh, Ms. Walton, please. Thank you, Dr. Reich. Um, I, I have a few thoughts in response to uh, Mr. Wilkins' uh, comments. Um, I believe that one of the reasons our bond proposals keep growing exponentially is because construction costs have inflated uh, dramatically. Uh, we've experienced that for the past five years, and it doesn't look like that's slowing down any. Uh, I'll put that in the form of, the, of a question. Is that true? Yes. Um, we've actually had some discussions with cost estimators who have helped with uh, some of these estimates. Um, I think since 2014, uh, what uh, we've been told is that uh, costs have escalated 15.6% uh, construction cost. Um, and uh, Mr. Horn, I think uh, how much on average, and I, there's been kind of some ebb and flow in that five year period. A couple of years were really, really high and a couple of years have kind yeah. of leveled out, but total over that period, 15.6%. Uh, and I'll let you, uh, Certainly. Uh, after looking back a bit, um, the uh, our cost estimators feel like that we we had um, a bit of a, a flat 2014 and 15, but then in 2016, 17, 18, we had uh, considerable growth, and that was in or escalation as we would call it in construction. A lot of that was tied to a significant um, a development, large large company development here in the, in this area. Uh, companies like Toyota and State Farm that built enormous facilities and pulled a lot of the high-end um, trades that we would use uh, in building schools and hospitals into those areas, in addition to some very large expansions like American Airlines and others mm -hmm. uh, in the area. So that that had a, that played a very significant part in those years, 16, 17, and 18, in seeing tremendous growth. The bulk of that 15.5 uh, or 6 percent uh, took place in those three years since uh, November of, of 18 uh, to present. We've seen a little bit of a flatter uh, spot in, in the construction costs or in, in not as much escalation. But but typically over the past 30 years, you know, you, you've seen anywhere from uh, from two to three uh, percent upwards to six and a half percent growth annually. And so it, it will continue to go up. Will, will it go up as much as it did in, in say, 16, 17, 18? Um, he's suggesting maybe it's flattened out a bit uh, for us, but uh, but we we still we still build into our estimates uh, escalation costs for construction, so that 
uh, we can try to handle that or absorb that as we go along. Right. And is that why this bond is as large as it is? I mean, one of the contributing factors to that? I mean, nat naturally, yes, you you know, dollars today are a great deal more expensive than they were, you know, five years ago or even 10 years ago. So uh, we, I can give you real numbers, uh, say, for building an elementary. Uh, 100,000 square foot elementary in 2001 was going for about 21 to 22 million dollars for that that elementary uh, that would look like McNutt and, mm -hmm. to, and today we would build McNutt for somewhere between 30 and 33 million so um, so you can expect that over time that uh, you know costs will continue to rise like that so. right so it's not so much that you know um, we're increasing the number of Pro projects or anything like that it's just but it's not strictly inflation I mean we've right. looked at that too if you take uh, just the the uh, uh, 552 million was the amount of the facilities portion of the 2014 bond program uh, and you inflate that um, it, uh, it it's it's ultimately less than the total presented here so uh, just in it, it mm -hmm. the the dollars presented here uh, include some incremental project and in need beyond what we had in 2014, along with uh, just you know the, the the more cyclical stuff and the impact of inflation. Thank you. Um, the uh, s uh, second item I'd like to address is the uh, Career Tech Center. I think we've talked around that a little bit. I, I think there we might be close to consensus there. Um, to adding it back, um, I, I think timing is just so bad you know, for this right now that I'd hate I'd hate to see that override what we really need to do. Uh, you know, the thing, you know, CTC is only two years old. You know, how can we possibly need to enlarge it? Um, yeah, but if we wait five more years how many kids are not going to be able to take advantage of programs we know they are interested in. So um, I, I want to stress that. And then um, I, I think Mr. Chapa touched on this. I really feel the committee has done a wonderful job and we need to respect the work of, of that committee and how carefully they looked at everything and sliced into uh, reducing scope of conditioning renovations and so forth and they did that very carefully I believe so um, that that's my two cents thank you miss Walton and I just want to interject uh, a, a comment that mr. Sturtz made at the last meeting uh, something that you kind of touched upon mr. Wilbanks uh, about uh, the community and, and uh, perception and we're going up and up and up. And Mr. Sturtz, what he addressed at the last meeting was very specifically about that, that that's going to be on us as far as communication out to our community, that no, that's, that's not it. Um, this, this time, yes, it's up because we're, we're still backlogged and we're still uh, catching up. Uh, but the next one likely isn't going to be near this level. We are going to be replacing schools and and raising and rebuilding, but uh, that that's our that's on us as far as a communication strategy out to the community to let them know and understand that this isn't this isn't just what we're doing. We're not out of control uh, in spending, and that we are conservative uh, and just trying to do the right thing. So I just wanted to put that out there. And with that, I will give the mic to President Mays. Okay, thank you. I have to speak just one more time, so I'll make it brief. And it sounds like y'all touched on a couple of things that I was going to say. And and one, um, the I wouldn't say that we're increasing the bond number over a period of time, or that it's exponentially increasing. To your point, to Dr. Sturt's point, um, what we're trying to do is address the needs that we have at this particular time. We're, we don't go into any bond picking a number and then trying to fit everything to meet that number. It's what are our needs at this time? We create strategic plans, and those strategic plans have bold thoughts and ideas. And what we're doing is accompanying those bold thoughts and ideas. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that we don't lose focus on that, because I, I know we all understand that, but we need to keep that focus that that's what we're doing. Um, I will not belabor 
Um, I agree if um, the presiding officer is saying that we discontinue the way that we were going. But what I will say, um, just out of, and I'm saying it very respectfully, but you know, making sure that I was here at this meeting tonight, no matter how I felt, that um, the, the committees have done their due diligence. None of this is really new information. So we need to make sure that we understand what our timeline is, be prepared um, to know that we have to make a decision within the next few weeks. So if you have some questions, if there's anything that um, you feel like you can't either support or not because you don't have enough answers, please make sure that you do your due diligence. Ask who you need to ask within the district what those questions are so that you can feel comfortable coming back and make that decision so that we can move forward. That's just a respectful request. Very good. Well said, and I don't see any more lights. So I think we have uh, covered everything quite adequately uh, this evening. Thank you so much uh, to everybody here uh, for all of the, the time and input. And uh, uh, we do have a lot to digest and a lot, uh, a lot of busy, big decisions ahead of us uh, in a short timeline. So thank you very much. Uh, Yes, Ms. Walton, please. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Reich. Uh, I caught two. There may be more, so y'all help me out. Uh, we had a request uh, for what is the magnitude of the waiting list at the Ag Center, uh, Ag Science Center. Uh, I think probably uh, somebody down there got that one. And the second one was how many undersized elementary gyms are there? So that was information that we, and the Mr. board... Ms. Powell's going to send me the 2014 survey. survey results. Okay, good. And the 2014 survey results. All right. And I, I think that's it. Well, I believe Mr. Chapa was also asking for additional information related to <laughs> CTC, CTC uh, and capacity, uh, building capacity at the campuses versus at the Career Tech Center, what that load looks like. Are we prepared? Thank you. Is our helping. number too low now or not? Okay. All right. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Walton. And uh, we will not be going into closed session, so the time is 1026. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you.